a very good morning to you all uh, this is dr samra chatterjee from mgm i on behalf of mgm I institute i welcome you all to this webinar uh, on phaco emulsification as we all know phaco emulsification has become the standard of care for cataract surgery and it's standard of care in almost all situations currently and most of us are practicing it routinely um Keeping this in mind, we have actually designed this webinar so that all aspects uh, of phaco emulsification will be covered in this session for the beginners also, and also for accomplished surgeons amongst us. There will be a learning experience for all today, something that we can pick up today and practice it tomorrow in our operating room. Today, we have very three uh, eminent ophthalmologists with us who are prolific world-renowned cataract surgeons. But most importantly, they are also very great teachers. You'll we'll all agree that practicing surgery is one thing, but teaching surgery is a completely different ball game. And those of us who teach, we know that how difficult it is to teach these surgeries. And all these three teachers, whom uh, three uh, surgeons that we have with us today, are excellent teachers, are teachers par excellence. So I'm sure we all will have a great learning experience today. And with these few words. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Deepshik Agarwal, Director of MJMI Institute, to give us the welcome address. Dr. Deepshik Agarwal. Thank you, Dr. Samrat. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, respected guest speakers, Dr. Harvind Shalal, Dr. Arup Chakravarti, Dr. Haripya Arvind, dear colleagues, seniors, and PG students. A very warm well welcome to all the renowned speakers and delegates who took out their valuable time and joined us today in the CME. As we know, in past five decades, cataract surgery has undergone in remarkable technical refinement with simplified post-operative care and faster visual recovery because of improved instrumentations, techniques, and better understanding. New lens designs are trying to provide a spectacle-free full range of vision distance in intermediate and near. But even with all the remarkable technologies, mathematical formulas, IOL power calculations are not perfect. Despite all the advancement, all methods and all lenses are not suitable for every patient. So selection of patient, method of surgery and selection of IOL should be very judiciously. Cater surgery is an ever evolving field. So today's FECO Shala will highlight the practical tips to handle all kinds of situations and making decisions for cataract surgery. Our guest speakers will share their knowledge and experience with us. So I look forward for an interacting and interesting sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for the welcome address. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Mihir, will you please share the screen? for uh, the virtual tour of the Institute. A tertiary eye care center in the capital city of Chhattisgarh state is giving excellent eye care since 2004. Here we are taking you in a virtual tour of this institute. There are multiple pleasant waiting lounges where patients can sit comfortably.
institute is well equipped with all the latest diagnostic ophthalmological machineries every patient who visits the institute undergoes a detailed eye examination as it has all the ophthalmic subspecialties under a single roof the hospital has its own microbiology and biochemistry lab as well as a permitted eye bank every patient and their relative are well explained and counseled about the advice surgery in details it also provides services of prosthetic eye implants according to cosmetic demand of patients who have lost their eye due to any eye disease a wide range of glasses and contact lenses are available in the optical shop the hospital has nine modular operation theaters in which all kind of eye operations are performed with latest technologies all the necessary aseptic precautions Hello. and sterilization of instruments are done effectively before and after performing every procedure facility of comfortable ward is available for patients requiring admission various ophthalmic courses are provided for both national and international trainees the outreach department of the hospital organizes various eye camps through which eye care services are provided to the underprivileged population free of cost patients eye care is the topmost priority of this institute good morning again to those who have just joined us so we are about to start the first session now we all know that before plunging into a surgery a practice surgeon prepares himself and our first session is designed precisely for that we will all agree that the best surgeon with the costly spectro machine or the most premium lens will flat will fall flat on their face if there is an error in i will power calculation or if we sit down in the operating room with the best of the spectro machine and do not know how to use it to our advantage as the surgery or the cataract demands but depend upon the service engineer to set the parameters for us so to address both these issues of i will power calculation and on phaco dynamics we have two of our very young and eminent faculty members from mjm institute dr bharat patil and dr monisa mahapatra who will share uh, their talks with us on i will power calculation and phaco dynamics so for uh, chairing and uh, for moderating this session i invite dr somen mishra dr kirti bhatia dr vasan verma dr jayashree pradhan and dr anupam sahu and dr munir mishra to moderate this session i welcome you all to this virtual dais and i request dr bharat patel to share his screen and begin the talk uh, also i'd like to remind everybody is that any questions you have please put it in the chat box i request everyone to keep their uh, microphones muted so that uh, you know unnecessary uh, uh, distractions and uh, these things do not happen to us if anybody has any difficulty in uh, sharing uh, or in uh, connecting they can please contact us and let us go for the session so it's all over to the panelists and the speakers for session 1 thank you good morning everyone uh, is my voice audible and uh, screen visible yes 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 
Uh, I welcome all of you to the topic um, on cataract surgery and fecal misbehavior, which is nearer to our heart and hence nearer to our pocket also. So we must know certain things. Uh, I will be dealing with the IL power calculation in special situation. Uh, can I proceed, sir? Yes, yes, sir. yes. Please. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, most important thing is the IL power calculation in after the coronal refractive surgery. Uh, it's really tricky and troublesome. Uh, since the, it's launched in 19, early 90s, uh, n number of patients opted for the coronal refractive surgery in the form of plastic or PRK, and the number is still increasing. So in near future, we may face such patients who uh, have cataract and had a previous refractive operation. So we must know uh, the correct way to calculate the power calculation because the routine ways, routine methods are failed and we may land up into the uh, significant surprise in the post operative period. Before going into the detail of the of formulas and ways available for IL power calculation after the coronary refractive surgery, let's brush up our knowledge over the theoretical IR power calculation formula. See, all the theoretical IR power calculation formula are based upon the Virgin's formula and which is based upon the Gaussian optics. Uh, in this formula, we know uh, we can calculate the axial length, we can calculate the keratometry, and we know the N1 and N2, which is the refractive index of the vitreous and the aqueous. Uh, so, uh, but what we don't know is the D. Uh, this D is nothing but the effective lens position. So, any theoretical IR power calculation formula we, which can predict this value of this D correctly gives us a accurate or near accurate IR power. Okay, so this effective lens position is the holy grail of every any theoretical IR power calculation formula. Depending upon the ways or, or variables the formula used for calculation of the ELP, this formula is divided into various uh, types. Uh, so, till we uh, the keratometry uh, is used for two things in all these versions formula. First, for the direct versions calculation and estimation of ELP. So, if we have wrong keratometry readings, uh, we can land up into the almost up to 78 percent of error in our power calculation prediction. Uh, so, what happens after coronary refractive surgery? There is a change in the anterior and posterior coronal uh, relationship, posterior coronal surface relationship. Both the anterior as well as posterior coronal surface acts as a refracting lens. And since there is a change in the anterior curvature and the thickness of the cornea after the refractive procedure, this relationship changes and subsequently the refractive index of the cornea also changes. And there is also change in the central corneal curvature with respect to the peripheral cornea. And we should not forget the problem of dry eye, which may trouble us while calculating the accurate K readings. We can deal with the dry eye, but these two things are inevitable. Uh, to summarize the errors, which can, can lead to the uh, diff difficult IR power calculation of refractive surgery, is a first is a refractive index error. As I told, there is a change in the anterior posterior corneal relationships, which leads to the change in the refractive index of the cornea. Whatever machines which we have are based upon the hypothetical 1.3375 refractive index as a corneal refractive index. So this will not hold true after the corneal refractive surgery. Another thing is a formula error. As KM, use, KM is used for the estimation of ELP, if KM is wrong, ELP will be wrong and subsequently the power will be wrong. And third is the instrument error. Since, for example, in myopic classic, the central cornea becomes flatter as compared to the peripheral cornea. So, the machine overestimates the K reading in such scenario. So, because of all these three errors, we land up into the wrong K and subsequently wrong IL power. So, how we can deal with that? Uh, first, we can uh, calculate, we can try to uh, measure the K value as accurate as we can. For example, using the tomography based systems. RTVU or Avanti XR and Pentacam. Or if we are using the topography, we can use the effective refractive power. Or we can measure the corneal power at different levels, uh, zero uh, at the center at 1 mm or 2 mm and 3 mm using the atlas rings. Another thing which we can use, we can apply the, some correction factors to the keratometry value which we got. Uh, the clinical estimator and contact lens or refraction method, the coach and bank formula and Shama's formula are examples for that. Or we can use the power calculation formula independent of the keratometry. 
for example double k method in double k method uh, the pre refractive surgery k is used for the elp calculation and post refractive k is used for the versions calculations now for q is another example where is elp is calculated independent of the keratometry and haggis l is a regression formula which uh, calculates the alpha independent of the keratometry uh, there are other methods are also available so it's very very confusing which method to use which method to trust the problem has made very very uh, easier by this introduction of the online calculators which are freely available on the uh, website of acrs.org what we have to do just to gather whatever data we have fill it correctly and at the end we can get the results this formula uh, these calculators have incorporated 14 different formulas and the most important thing is that they give average of all the formulas available minimum maximum value so we can calculate we can estimate the power according to uh, or the whatever data we have but most important thing what we can do to avoid error is use more than one method to determine the keratometry did the dry eye first calculate your keratometry before proceeding for any contact procedures use the online calculators available they are very simple to use and while transcribing the data from your uh, machine to the calculators our transcription errors and try to obtain the old records if possible they are not mandatory but if available they will also help us to estimate the alp or calculation after the refractive surgery and make sure we rule out the ectasia or any progression before going for the surgery in such scenario we should always rule out the progression of ectasia if it is there then it is better to avoid the surgery at that time and one point i like to highlight is centration or ablation zones because all these corrections factors will apply correctly when you when the center of the cornea and ablation zone is exactly at the center for example if the centration uh, ablation zone is off center so if we apply all these correction factors we may be applying that correction factors to the normal k reading so whole of our calculation will be wrong so these are the important points another thing uh, we, uh, another condition is uh, similar to this uh, post classic uh, calculation is keratoconus or ectasia as i highlighted earlier the all these keratometry readings are based upon this magic number of 1.375 which may not be true in cases of keratoconus or ectasia and visual axis may not correlate with this tippest part of the cornea so try, again in this scenario also try to use multiple methods to calculate the keratometry uh, tomography will be the best use optical methods for calculation of the excellent because for the same reason the corneal tip may not correlate with the visual axis and if the we have to use the formula best one will be the barrett's followed by the rbf and again rule out any progression or ectasia before going for the surgical planning there are options of torical are also available for the keratoconus but if you ask me this cal toric calculators are based upon the normal tube data normal corneal data so they may not hold true for the al power calculation in case of the keratoconus first second uh, the toric al can add abrasions in already uh, compromised corneal surface so we may land up into trouble though there are al different types of als available from five adapter to almost up to the 28 adapters uh, i am not in favor of use of torricals in case of keratoconus simply for the reason because these ials are made for regular astigmatism and not for the irregular astigmatism i would like to know the uh, opinion of others uh, on this topic also another thing for torrical calculation most important thing is reference marking there are different reference markers available we can use any marker which we are comfortable again use more than one method for keratometry use optical methods for calculating this spherical equivalent there are online calculators available which are very easy to use and most important point is to correct the posterior curvature most of these online calculators have incorporated this calculation and use the uh, under treat the wtr and over treat the atr another important uh, situation which we face is calculation of the al power calculation in the c silicon oil field i 
uh, everybody knows the correction factor of 0.71 because as the uh, ultrasonic uh, bi biometer is based upon the principle of sonar, uh, when the sound wave is traveling slowly, it estimates that the, the echo is coming from the distance. That's why the uh, eye with the silicon oil field eye is slightly longer on uh, ultrasonic biometer as compared to the optical biometer. So use the correction factor. And one more important point I like to highlight is that when the patient is supine, uh, it is not this, and the eye is underfilled with the silicon, the uh, ultrasonic waves will travel both through the fluid as well as the oil. So you, uh, the Excel line recorder will be wrong. What we need, the, the sonic wave should travel only through the oil if you are applying the correction factor of 0.71. So if you are going for this uh, ultrasonic biometer, use a sitting position. And there are AL variations and different formulas are prescribed for different types of excellent for the shorter excellent offer Q, uh, the Barrett's 2 and Hill RBF is accurate for various uh, excellent range. Olsen C is a good option. Uh, and for myopic guys, SRKT performs better. But if you ask me, uh, Barrett's 2 and Hill RBF performs well in all the range of excellence. Thank you, everyone. That's all from my side. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for the uh, very nice and comprehensive talk. And you have simplified the issues. Uh, I have one small request that last slide that you have this it is available in many of the websites but uh, for our uh, participants and also for all the viewers it would be uh, you know quite uh, easy if you can make a small image of that and share it so that they can they Dr. Samrat, can i give a comment yes yes please please absolutely this is actually uh, you all need you all need to moderate the session so Please. Yes, Welcome. this is uh, Professor Mishra from AIMS Raipur. Dr. Bharat. Yes, sir. Uh, just directly starting into the refract uh, IOL power calculation after refractive surgery, uh, you should have talked about the regular IOL power calculation because ultimately the most of the FECO surgeries which we are performing or people are performing are non-refractive uh, operate, non uh, operated. Sir, uh, uh, I got the uh, your uh, point, but uh, what you have uh, about is 10 minutes and uh, the topic which I am dealing with uh, is Alvar calculation in spatial situations. It's actually yes, that's you are true, absolutely but... right. Uh, this uh, the way we had designed this talk because for the normal cases, in most of the normal cases, it is practically very straightforward and routine, and it is very uh, you know uh, it's a very didactic lecture. So within that special time, we thought that in, in 10 minutes time, we thought that it would be not be possible to cover both the normal and the abnormal. By now, most of us are very well aware of the normal part, but we do take your point in consideration. And in the next session, uh, in, in one of the next webinars, we can have actually a very detailed thing on I will power calculation. So your point is uh, very, very well made and we'll take note of it. Thank you, sir. So I would now request Dr. Bharat to kindly uh, stop screen sharing and request Dr. Monalisa to start the screen share. Anybody would like to make any, uh, you know, uh, amongst the panelists, any comments on their experiences on uh, dealing with this complex situations of maybe post-refractive weather. Now we are getting the LASIK and the RK generations are now developing cataract. So, so we are getting more and more patients uh, of that uh, age group. Dr. Basan, Dr. Basan Verma, would you like to make a comment? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, what about keratokanas? Uh, though uh, he said ki I would not uh, like to put toric Dr. Anupam, you want to add something? Dr. Uh, Bharat, will you please stop your screen sharing? Dr. Bharat, and then answer uh, Dr. Uh, Basan Verma's question. Yes, yes, Dr. Basant. Uh, Sir, I, I wanted to emphasize that why why, why are you are leaving uh, keratokinous patient for not connecting it with toric IOL? Anyway, if some changes occur, it will be a minor change and it can be adjusted in the uh, specs later on. But at that time itself, when you are uh, uh, giving good post-operative vision to keratokinous patients, 
uh, changes will not be very much after that it can be corrected by specs later on so why you don't want to put toric iol in ketoconus patients doctor bharat would you like to take that stigmatism doctor bharat could you could doctor understand- bharat yes sir actually uh, if uh, dr bharat please answer uh, uh, i could not hear you sir no no i am okay Sorry. yeah dr basant actually wanted to know uh, good morning sir uh, that uh, can we put toric iols you said that toric iols would not be preferable in irregular astigmatism yes cases. sir uh, my uh, opinion is that can it be used in keratoconus uh, patients okay. because they have very high astigmatism so we would be able to provide them some benefit with the toric iol uh, sir first first my point point i want to highlight that the toric iols are for the regular astigmatism one second the whatever toric iol calculators we have is for the based upon the normative data from the normal cornea okay and third the toric iol adds the optical aberrations into the vision system so because of all these three points i personally not in favor of using toric iols in case of keratoconus there are other options which we can use for rehabilitation of these patients for irregular astigmatism most important after doing a routine surgery we can uh, use the contact lenses rgp is for such patients this is what i feel that's why i ask uh, about the host opinion whether that can be used personally i don't feel it should be used in case of keratoconus yeah, no no i would also agree i would agree with dr bharat because you think because in keratoconus you have irregular astigmatism yes sir and uh, it is better that uh, we leave uh, this patients with a routine uh, lens rather than going for a toric lens can you correct uh, all all irregular astigmatism with a, your rose k contact lens there are limitation with contact lens also sir so if we are correcting if, part if you are correcting partly with toric iol we will ha- we will will have more better results with rose k lenses no sir if we if the rose k lens can be fitted huh. if the rose k lens can be fitted on a irregular cornea of a keratoconus patient then there is actually uh, it will correct all the astigmatism because it will form the tear film so none of the irregular astigmatism will be there i think uh, uh, we can discuss this on the chat chat box more uh, other Uh, viewers and panelists can share their opinion in the chat box and let us go to the next uh, session uh, or next talk of this session by dr monalis on pico dynamics so so i request everybody to actually you know put their opinion and uh, uh, opinion about uh, irregular on this uh, in correct corner in the chat box we can continue the discussion there dr monalis sir please okay good morning everyone am i audible Yes. Okay, so I'll be talking about phaco dynamics. So it is uh, actually not possible to cover each and every aspect of phaco dynamics in only fifteen minutes time. So I'll be uh, only limiting my discussion to some important aspects of phaco dynamics, and it will be a, a video assisted presentation. not moving okay so fluidics it consists of infusion and aspiration system it helps to remove the emulsate from the anterior chamber it counteracts the potential heat build up at the phaco tip and counteracts the repulsive action of the phaco tip if we are using only in longitudinal phaco it maintains the adequate anterior chamber depth and pressure ultrasound energy it helps to emulsify the crystalline lens fluidics plus ultrasound energy is phaco emulsification there are different phaco parameters available uh, which we can adjust these are adjustable parameters these are flow rate vacuum and power so we adjust these parameters uh, to our convenient settings to have a good and safe surgery 
Aspiration flow rate, it is the primary force that attracts the material towards the phaco tip. It determines how fast the material comes towards the phaco tip, which is called fallibility. Rise time, it is a time taken to reach the maximum preset vacuum after occlusion has been achieved. Uh, this is uh, true only for the peristaltic pump uh, machines. Uh, so, uh, because most of the FECO machines nowadays are using the peristaltic pump system. So I'll be talking only about the peristaltic pump. Yes, there are different other pumps are available, which I'm not going to uh, talk in my uh, this discussion. Uh, the higher is the flow rate, lesser is the rise time, and sooner the debris will get cleared from the anterior chamber. Now, in the left video, you can see the AFR is set at 18, and in the right video, the AFR is set at 35. Now, please. Uh, focus on this uh, video, uh, you can appreciate the rate of emulsification of the nucleus material in the left video where the AFR is set at a low limit, uh, it is little so slower. And the rate of emulsification of nucleus material and getting uh, uh, this material cleared from the anterior chamber, it is faster when the AFR is set at a higher limit. And also when the AFR is high, then the vacuum rise time is also quick. So vacuum, it is the suction force that is created by the pump. Okay, so it determines the uh, holding power of the FACO tip. So when the tip is fully occluded, that is in case of peristaltic pump system, then we get the maximum of our preset vacuum. Okay, so you can see in this video, when the FACO tip is completely occluded into the nuclear substance, uh, when there is a full occlusion, uh, you can see the preset vacuum, which was 350, we are getting the maximum of the preset vacuum. So we can, uh, we can set the vacuum at different settings for doing different steps of FACO emulsification surgery. So during sculpting, we make a group, we make a central group. So, so for that, uh, we set our uh, FACO power adequately and we set the vacuum at low, uh, low limit. Why? Because we only, we don't need to hold the nucleus with a strong holding force. Uh, this low vacuum is only required to clear up the debris from the anterior chamber. But when we are doing chopping, at this time, we need a good hold of the nucleus uh, with the FACO uh, tip. So for this, high vacuum is required. So if the vacuum set is not adequate, if the vacuum is set at a lower limit, then we'll say what happens. So here in this video, you can see the vacuum is set at 150. Okay, so uh, the FACO tip is getting buried into the nucleus and uh, there is occlusion. But when I was trying to do the chopping, occlusion got broke and I could not do the chopping. So the reason uh, for this occlusion break and uh, failure chopping is the vacuum was set at a lower limit and the FACO tip was not buried uh, uh, nicely into the FACO, uh, uh, this uh, nucleus substance. Uh, so similarly, while doing quarter emulsification, uh, we need a high vacuum uh, to hold uh, uh, this nucleus pieces uh, uh, with the FACO tip and eventually we give FACO energy to uh, emulsify the nucleus pieces. Uh, so this avoid uh, unnecessary dissipation of energy in the eye. Similarly, while doing cortex was we need a uh, high vacuum to get a strong hold of the nucleus. And while doing visco was uh, also the vacuum is set at high uh, setting uh, to uh, do a quick AC was. So FACO power, it is the multiplication of frequency and stroke length. Frequency, it is constant for all the machines. We cannot uh, change the frequency for any machine. So how to modulate the FACO power by changing the stroke length. Stroke length, it is actually the length of the needle movement, the to and fro movement of the FACO needle. So if uh, the power is set at 50%, limit, 50% then 50% uh, 50 of the length of the FACO needle is available for to and fro movement. And if the power is set at 100%, then 100% of the needle length is available for to and fro movement. So it is very important to keep your power at uh, adequate setting while, uh, while doing uh, FACO emulsification in the first surgery, uh, in the first uh, video, in the left video, you can appreciate uh, this uh, nucleus is a hardened nucleus. It is almost three to uh, four grade of nucleus, uh, but the power set is only 30. Okay, so while doing trenching, the FACO needle is not able to cut through the nucleus. Uh, instead, there is only mechanical pushing of the whole nuclear and back complex, which can lead to unnecessary stress on the genus and can lead to development of jet D. 
so in this same surgery when the vac uh, power was increased to 80 uh, then the phaco needle can uh, smoothly cut through the nucleus and uh, one nice group could be created so there are different modes of phaco energy delivery one is the continuous mode continuous mode is again divided into linear type and panel type a continuous linear mode uh, it is actually when we are in foot position 3 and we replace the foot pedal more then we get the energy in a uh, linear gradual manner okay the energy increases gradually so if we are at the mid, uh, midpoint of the foot position 3 then we get almost 50% of our preset uh, power and if we are at the lowest point of the position 3 then we'll get uh, the 100% of the preset power pulse mode you can say it is a variant of uh, linear mode because uh, uh, here like in the linear mode uh, the way we depress the foot pedal position uh, foot pedal in the position 3 uh, the energy will increase gradually but the difference is the energy is not continuous all throughout the position 3 uh, in between we get off time okay so there is a pulse of energy followed by off period then again a pulse of energy followed by off period so uh, we can reduce the duty cycle duty cycle means the amount of time uh, where the phaco power is on so duty cycle can be reduced to 50% or even less so uh, the um, benefit of using this pulse mode is we need the uh, uh, this uh, pulse mode can provide more time to the phaco needle to cool down and it can uh, help in aspirating the nucleus because when the phaco power is on then uh, in case of longitudinal phaco there is repulsion of the nucleus material from the phaco tip and when it is off then with the help of fr and vacuo the pieces comes towards the phaco tip and overall energy delivery into the eye also decreases so this pulse mode it is typically very essential while doing sculpting in case of a uh, hard nucleus so in hard nucleus we uh, set the power at higher setting and uh, we need to uh, do the trenching for a little longer time so if we are doing the uh, trenching uh, uh, with the, uh, using continuous uh, power delivery mode uh, then uh, eventually we uh, give more energy to the eye and that can heat up the phaco uh, needle uh, which can cause uh, own burn and which can uh, cause more endothelial cell loss so to prevent it we can use pulse mode because in between we get uh, this uh, off interval where the needle gets time to cool down another mode of energy delivery is burst mode so we can say it is a variant of panel mode so in the panel mode when we are in the position 3 we get a full 100% of the preset power and the power remains constant all throughout but in burst mode when we reach uh, put, put, uh, position 3 then we get a burst of energy which is 100% of the preset power followed by one uh, off interval then another burst of energy followed by another interval so as we decreases the foot pedal more in position 3 this interval it decreases and subsequently it becomes a uh, continuous uh, mode of delivery so it is helpful while we are doing hard cataract surgery it reduces the risk of wound burn so it is actually particularly helpful when we are doing the chopping so uh, how we do chopping we give few burst of energy and bury the tip into the nucleus substance and by the help of uh, then we go to position 2 and hold the piece with vacuum and by the help of a second instrument we uh, divide the nucleus into smaller fragments if we are using continuous or pulse mode uh, then there is chance of more emulsification of the nucleus and our hold becomes uh, lighter and uh, we uh, could not be able to do uh, chopping uh, easily similarly when when we are doing quadrant uh, removal uh, in case of harder nucleus burst mode is prefer preferred because uh, we'll get uh, off time in between uh, so uh, which can reduce the uh, uh, this uh, overheating of phaco tip related complication so you have to uh, press the you have to be uh, like partially in position 3 you should not go straight down otherwise it will become continuous so in the position 3 if you are partially depressed then you will get burst of power uh, followed by some interval of off time so another uh, another 
a uh, method of uh, uh, doing phaco surgery is using torsional phaco newer machine they have this technique so it is different from the longitudinal phaco it has more it is more effective than the longitudinal jackhammer effect and it produces less heat okay and uh, there is repul uh, less repulsion of the nucleus uh, matter from the phaco tip so here the phaco tip movement is sideways so another important point which all of us should know is surge so how surge happens when occlusion break is there then there is sudden withdrawal of fluid from the anterior chamber which can cause collapse of the anterior chamber and uh, subsequently some other intraoperative complication can happen so you can appreciate in this video uh, there was occlusion followed uh, by this uh, there is occlusion break and after this red circle comes if you see uh, very minutely then you can see dimpling of the corneal tissue at this area okay so there is occlusion there is occlusion break so now this is surge this is dimpling of the corneal uh, tissue so we can prevent surge by decreasing the afr decreasing the vacuum by constructing tight own or raising the bottle height and obviously a new machine they have venting system to prevent surge so my take home message is would be higher the afr lesser the rise time and sooner the clearance of the debris from the anterior chamber uh, vacuum only builds up when there is complete occlusion this is for only peristaltic machines so in case of trenching you have to set the vacuum at low limit and if uh, you are doing chopping or quadrant emulsification then set the vacuum at high uh, limit uh, so you have to decide your power according to the density of the nucleus if you are doing surgery on hard cataract then use burst mode if there is surge then you can avoid surge by lowering the afr and uh, decreasing the vacuum and you can raise the bottle height and by venting this can be prevented thank you thank you dr monalisa for uh, in a very short time so beautifully concising the very very important parts about phaco dynamics um so i leave it for discussion uh, anybody li like to make any comments about this we also have with us uh, dr uh, harban slal has joined us so while we take questions uh, may i request you sir to kindly share your screen uh, so that we will be able to you know Uh, continue without any delay panelist of this session can comment and able to share this screen yeah. so uh, dr basant sharma would you like to make any comment on uh, uh, psychodynamics very well explained i think that made my job easier thank you thank you sir uh, i wanted to ask uh, one question if you have uh, acupulse and acubus mode in your phaco machine uh, which one you will like to use it for you know uh, hyperpulse uh, hyper uh, uh, so no acupulse question is for me or for dr harbans then if for you you have okay to... okay so uh, this hyperpulse mode it is very uh, uh, helpful if uh, we are doing the trenching in case of hard cater and hyperburst you can use while uh, doing emulsification of uh, quadrants uh so, um, what, i think what that uh, acupulse and acubust sorry i am not aware of acupulse and no, acupulse. is it is it for a particular machine because sometimes you know the same machines use different different names Achha. I think there is a very clear. This is either pulse mode or a burst mode. Burst mode. Name you might give. Yeah. And burst mode is very rarely used for one reason. I mean, if the density of the nucleus is uniform, then you can use burst mode. But because we want to modulate the energy given, so we usually use the foot pedal mode or pulse mode, where the frequency. I mean, in between you get a cooling period for the tip to cool down. Burst mode only in a very dense hard cataract where you feel that that modulation of the energy is not required. You can go for the burst mode. Uh, in acupulse and acubus mode, what happens? He even if you are in the continuous phaco, the moment tip occlusion occurs, machine automatically switches to pulse mode or burst mode. That is what I I I, I which, have. Which machine? Which machine? Acupuls and acupus. Which machine you are talking about? I am uh, um, that uh, this one, Centurion. That I am not aware that any such mode is in the Centurion. This I'll find out. And But another good idea. It's a good idea if it switches between the two modes. 
that would be a great feature and uh, another thing i wanted to ask is how we can uh, use the duty cycle smartly how can you set the duty cycle in your uh, fico machine if it is available okay so if you are using pulse or burst setting then that time only you can set the duty cycle uh, so duty cycle basically is the time when the feco energy is on so uh, we always want to give less power into the eye to provide unnecessary complication like endothelial cell loss or uh, wound burn so uh, it depends on the uh, which uh, step of feco surgery you are doing uh, so if you want uh, a continuous kind of cutting uh, then you can uh, uh, more uh, you can keep uh, duty cycle uh, like little more or if you want uh, quadrant emulsification then you can keep your duty cycle little less thank you dr vasant and dr feel, monalisa yeah. for uh, what the discussion i think uh, we can carry on the discussion in the chat box uh, uh, i would request everybody to uh, look into the chat box for the discussion that is going on and i also thank all our panelists for this session and uh, so uh, we end the session 1 and we start the session 2 now at least we know something about feco dynamics and the iol power calculation in the uh, specific situation so we are now slightly prepared for the surgery and we have with us a very eminent feco surgeon a teacher dr harbans lal who will gently guide us into the actual surgery he will deal with soft cataracts and hard cataracts and mind you both are very hard surgeries so a very soft cataract can also become very hard in certain situations and also he'll be dealing with total cataracts in different situations which are even hard surgeries and then premium iols which are not soft for the pocket either premium iols are hard for the pocket so this session is going to be all hard and i invite uh, he has already shared his screen so now i'd like to invite a second uh, group of panelists who are all very eminent feco surgeons heart tackling feco surgeons from chatisgarh dr anand saxena dr harjwardhan gupta dr lc madaria dr ashok jain dr arshad siddiqui and our own dr devashish das to the virtual dais uh, so that uh, they can moderate and discuss in this session and i also request dr devashish das to kindly introduce dr harbans lal sir thank you thank you sir thank you sir uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity to introduce uh, our most eminent uh, guest speaker dr harvans lal i welcome you sir and uh, i convey my deep regards towards you sir he is a pioneer in the technique of faco emulsification of course he doesn't uh, need any introduction we all uh, have learned faco and pearls from you sir sir is going to uh, sail through uh, some of the challenging cases that will uh, look uh, easy sir was one of the first surgeon in india to popularize and teach topical faco and uh, he has uh, uh, currently is a director of uh, delhi eye center and vice president of aios sir has previously had done many uh, positions like treasurer of aios library officer of dos and president of uh, dos and uh, so many innumerable uh, posts and sir has taken some of the uh, path breaking uh, step that are current still currently followed such as starting collegium uh, and travel fellowships and what else we now have the aos headquarters who has not read sir's book on uh, faco emulsifications sir uh, we have learned so much from your books and we are still learning uh, in terms of workshops instruction courses sir has done more than 100 life surgeries in india and abroad we are really indebted to you sir uh, for giving your valuable time thank you sir nerds uh, for you to uh take the session through sir uh thank you dr devashish for a wonderful introduction and i thank uh, mgm i institute for giving me this opportunity to share my views on some of the challenging cases so i'll be keeping my talk very brief given the time constraint 
So I'll straight away start on the soft and hot cathode first. So we all know that we need to perform the surgery in a central safe zone. And to perform the surgery in the capsule of cornices or in the angle, then there are chances of more trauma to the structures. So the what are the normally what we do is we nurse the nucleus and put portal position to worry the faculty by taking our foot pedal into position three and creating and burying the tip. And then we come back to the foot pedal position two to hold our vacuum seal the nucleus. Then we chop the nucleus, pull the nucleus into the central safe zone and aspirate there alternating our foot pedal between two or three. This is what is our standard FACO procedure. Now what happens in cases of a soft cataract, you are not able, you have got to lower the vacuum because if you keep the vacuum high, the soft cataract gets sucked in. So there is a very poor vacuum seal and it gives a very poor hold. Club with the sticky nucleus, which is attached all along you are not able to pull into the central safe zone and the nucleus gets smelled into the peripheral unsafe zone. This is where you can have a PCR. So there is now a very simple technique for this. What you need to do is remove the part of the anterior UP nuclear plate, which is lying between the rectus margin and the nucleus. That means up to the delineation line, this is at between 100 and 150 vacuum. I'm going close to the rectus margin and sucking this epinuclear plate out. Once you take out this epinuclear plate, whether up to 270 degree, 180 degree, or even 360 degree, this, this nucleus, there's no resistance for the nucleus to get collapsed into the central section. This very simple step, you just have to remove the part of the anterior epinuclear plate and you will see that the nucleus will collapse into the central safe zone without any problem. So irrespective of the density of the soft cataract, on the other hand, in harder cataract, there's no issue because you can have a very good vacuum seal. You can hold the nucleus, can chop it and pull it. And if the epinucleus is coming along, you can separate it with the chopper or a second instrument. So you can either collapse this nucleus in proto into the interior chamber, uh, you can divide into two, whatever you, way you like. And then you can see the already nucleus is collapsed. You don't have to pull it. And notice that my FACO tip under no stage of the surgery has gone into the unsafe zone. And when you are removing the anterior epinuclear plate, at that time, because the nucleus is there, there is no way you can damage the posterior capsule or the cornea or the iris. So my FACO tip always means in the central zone, and this easily you can emulsify the nucleus. Just very simple tip, remove part of the EP nucleus underneath the anterior capsular rim up to the delineation line and you will be able to perform all the soft cataract very easily without any problem. So now, if you see that I have divided this nucleus into two and I have not removed the epinuclear plate. So what happens when I chop it and want to pull it out, now I go there, hold it and separate it. And when I want to collapse it, it won't come. Then I hold it at the other place. And then when I try to pull it, it won't come. So I'm able to hold it. I'm trying to pull it, but because of the sticky epinuclear plate, I'm not able to collapse it. And same is up now if I remove the part of the, now this is becomes very unsafe if I try to remove it, because the entire part has been taken away. So what I, I'll show you now, if I remove the part of the epinucleus beforehand, then this nucleus will collapse without any problem. So the, I'm just showing you second video, though there was no need, but I thought just to highlight the point, because many of young doctors, initially they get a soft attack to operate. And they feel it is very easy, but they perform the FACO in unsafe zone, causing the PCR. So now let's see how easily 
is gets separated and comes to the central safe room. So you might you will have to practice uh, forceps rexus. Many times rexus is difficult. Anti perinuclear plate removal is must. Prolapse the nucleus or hymen nucleus into the central soap zone. Power vacuum flow rate has to be kept low. I mean, uh, as already explained, you don't want to bite through the nucleus, so the settings have to be on the lower side. So while on the hard cathode settings, power high to avoid pushing. In the soft cathode, we do not want it to get sucked. We don't want to go so much of energy. In this, we don't want to push the nucleus. So if you feel that the 30% or 40% power will be required, you keep it at 50. While on a soft track cathode, if you feel the 50 <laughs> <power> <laughs> <will be required laughs> at and you will need long and sharp chopper. Today, I'm going to talk about how to operate hard cathetic with average skill and excellent understanding of the biomechanics. While operating hard cathetic, certain anatomical facts are to be kept in mind. The central part of the nucleus is densest, thickest, and deepest. It is concave backwards, and most of these cathetics have posterior lathery plate. To manage these challenges, I am going to demonstrate my technique of free trench, rotational separation, and radial split. For this, I will recommend using long and sharp chopper designed by my dear friend Dr. Mohan Rajan and Kelman Tip for ease of trenching. Now I will explain what is free trench. We make trench which is horizontally and vertically in the shape of V as shown in the diagram. Horizontally to accommodate the sleeve of the paco tip and vertically to reach to the depth of the central nucleus. Now watch the video. Very purple block has been given. Temporal temple incision has been made. Capsorexis is being made larger nasally and on the left side. This is the area where most of the chopping, the splitting and crushing of the nuclear fragment is going to take place. This prevents inadvertent damage to the capsule axis margin and collapse of the nucleus into the anterior chamber. No hydro procedure has been done at this stage. This gives excellent visibility of the nucleus for trenching. To make a pattern of we start trenching paracentrally to have a wider trench at the periphery. The speed of the tip movement, energy delivered, and depth discovered should be such that there is no pushing of the nucleus and no cavitation power formation. If you are pushing the nucleus, that means energy delivered is less. If there is a calculation power formation, that means energy demand is much more than needed. Now, it's got more in the center to have vertical V trench. After withdrawing the chopper, we inject the viscoelastic and then withdraw the probe to prevent the shallowing of the anterior chamber. Now, we will perform gentle hydro dissection before rotating the nucleus. Hydro delineation is not needed. Keep the chopper at the periphery of the trench and rotate the nucleus. Now look how wide the peripheral part accommodates the tip and sleeve comfortably to deepen the trench in the center. After adequate trenching, we split the nucleus. Nucleus has been divided into two parts, but the posterior laser plate is holding on. Now I will demonstrate my technique of rotational separation and radial split. Body the vapor tip at the peripheral end of the heminucleus, hold it firmly with high vacuum setting of 600 millimeter mercury hold second heavy nucleus at the periphery with the chopper and start rotating you can see nice radial split taking place 
once it reaches the center stop it now we will rotate the nucleus and repeat the rotational separation and radial split to divide the lazy plate into two when you try to separate the lazy plate by lateral separation you are trying to clear too many fibers in one go requiring much higher force not holding the nucleus with the fiber tip makes it unstable and you put too much of pressure onto the posterior capsule and genus while you use my technique of radial separation you are holding and lifting the nucleus and there is no pressure on the capsule or genus at the same time using a radial split you are tearing one fiber at a time requiring much less energy now we come to second part of the surgery what is called vaco aspiration hold the hemicyclus deeper and at the densest part with high vacuum setting of 600 mm of mercury place the long and sharp chopper within the ccc margin adjacent to the tip bury it move it lightly to spit keep on repositioning the chopper closer to the fibers you want to split separated nuclear fragment should be as small as possible this should be further broken mechanically by chopper this improves the solubility of the fragment and prevents in adherent damage to corneal endothelium use the combination of lateral and radial separation to tear the lazy fibers now we come to the removal of the second half of the nucleus in this i use modified peripheral chop whereby i pull the periphery of the nucleus out of the rectus margin and start the chopping combination of the lateral and rotational separation is used to break the lazy fibers and nucleus is crushed mechanically and emulsified now most of the nucleus has been emulsified we need to take extra precaution because the posterior capsule can move forward now we are going to remove our chopper we inject viscoelastic to push the posterior capsule back reduce the vacuum setting to 500 and change the chopper from sharp and long to blunt and short now we are come to the removal of the last fragment and this time posterior capsule and cornea both of them are highly vulnerable we lower the vacuum setting to 400 and use the chopper to keep the fragment in front of the tip and away from the cornea that rectus is larger nearly and on to the left hand side day one patient had absolutely clear cornea and 69 vision hello can you hear me yes sir you audible yeah just i wanted to know how to go to the next presentation uh, i i will have to open the you can stop the screen sharing and then you can open the next presentation i have stopped sharing now then you can open, open my presentation. next powerpoint presentation so i make this screen small yes how to Click to full screen. Which may 
You can just stop the screen yeah, sharing yeah, yeah, video. Yeah, yeah. I need to come to the full. Yeah, full screen. How to go to the full screen now? This. Yeah. Share yes, yes, yes. Now, uh, yeah, actually, yes. I never had so many presentations in one go. <laughs> anyway, now you can go uh, full. Screen. Yeah, now it's okay. Uh, full screen, full screen. Yeah, so now I'll talk about oh, the input. Uh, you have to go to full screen now. I have to go to full screen, it is down there. Uh, yes, yes, it's, it's already full screen on my laptop. Okay, but here it's not showing. Okay. Yeah, if I start video, I'll be the one. 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 i just below the uh, percentage you have no uh, yeah. right right down no on the on the main uh, tv screen with the same yes 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 your cursor is there no same you have to yeah, go this down. is zoomed it zooms uh, is there yes besides this is a powerpoint yes yes in that only you have to go down yeah only yeah. for what's your uh, right side no, no. You have a projector type uh, icon down. Which type of icon? Projector, projector type. There's a cloud icon. There's a PS. I... Okay, can you just uh, give me the permission for the yeah, it's not coming. I don't know. I'm seeing completely over here. Full. Yeah, yeah, you can do it. No problem. Maybe sir can stop. Yes, it has come. Oh, right. No, it's fine. Okay. Yes, sir, it has come. Yeah, you can just uh, now go next, next, next. Click. Oh, is it okay? Yes, yes, yes. Can you see now screen? Yes, that's fine. So, so the next stop is total uh, instrument instrument cataract and uh, total cataract with glaucoma. So the point of discussions over here, whether we should give a paleo-barber block, we know the capsular restrictive diseases, whether we should do the hydro procedures, how to go about the nucleotomy in presence of the rectus margin tear, and should we use the capsular tension mean. So the, I think uh, those who have been trained along with uh, my time, and uh, when we used to do extra capsular cataract section, at that time we used to give a peri block. So the periverbal block, and if you tie a super pinky or do the massage of the eyeball and the orbit, then the vitreous volume is reduced by 40%. That means vitreous becomes concave and the vitreous prolapse was avoided in an open wound. Because once the vitreous is concave, and if the eyeball prolapses, it will go in, it will not be able to come out. Why mannitol reduces the vitreous volume only by 7%. And while patient may be uncomfortable, may have to need to the, go to the toilet. So whenever the chamber is very shallow, so it is very important that you reduce the vitreous volume. IOP can be controlled by the fluidics and settings and a bottle height. But orbital pressure, the ventricular ophthalmos and vitreous ophthalmos cannot be controlled by the mannitol. So if you use this, vitrectomy can be avoided in a shallow chamber and I have been doing it and I found it very, very effective. And capsule access, of course, we can do double, triple access and gepto femto, of course, do helps. And we need to understand how to do frequent presence of a rexis extension. So this is, and try to make rexis as small as possible. So in this patient, you can see that we are making to, the trying to make a very small rexis. Luckily, probably the fluid is not so much into the entire part. But the idea is that you make the smallest possible rexis 
because at a particular eye point that most of the time whenever the rectus goes beyond 4 mm diameter it has got a pore 4.5 it has got more tendency to run away and uh, then after seeing that there is no intralentricular pressure or some of the pockets of the fluid removed and you can do the enlarge the rectus and this is the if you don't have a rectus forcep and the most of the retina colleagues of yours will have plenty of uh, yellow peeling forceps which can use which you can use as a rectus forcep and uh, this can go from the side port as well so this rectus is not so big it's a medium size rectus but reasonably good enough to complete the phaco emulsification once this phaco is performed and after putting the lens you can enlarge the rectus once again so this is a, a sinusoidal lexus is the another way of uh, doing the same thing. You start with a smaller once you get a confidence that it won't run out, then you can enlarge. And many people had device like uh, Paco Pancho and the round needle like swing machine technique of Rajendra Prashad who described. So there are many methods to relieve the intralentricular pressure. And uh, in spite of all those precautions and all those things done, even doing a YAG laser punctures a few hours before can relieve the pressure, six hours, four hours before can relieve the lenticular pressure. So a lot of things have been done. And the one thing very important, do not over pressurize the ball while doing rectus because it will increase the intralenticular pressure more. I mean, you don't have to inject too much of a viscoelastic. It will increase the pressure. So don't... Uh, we had normal tendency to pressurize the eyeball. We should keep the eyeball little on the softer side only. So this is again uh, the patient had cataract with the glaucoma, and you can see the, the cornea is edematous. So you don't have to worry about it. So the peribulbar block has been given. The pressure has been released, and then we you can see that hardly we can put any air inside. And we place the hooks. And you can see the after putting the viscoelastic one is still a stain. Either you will have to wash all the viscoelastic or just put a little bit of dye underneath the viscoelastic to improve the visibility. And uh, see the as soon as we uh, do the rexus, it is trying to run away and it has gone out. I am trying to retrieve it but fail to do so. And you can see already gone beyond excess margin. So there is no point if it is not coming. And then I release over here so that I can have a good amount of opening in the center. So let it go now if it has gone, whether it is a one place or two place really makes not much of a difference. And you notice that the hooks which are placed on a trapezoid shape, that means the hooks which are closer to the inc uh, our incision are closer to each other, while the hooks on the other side are wider to pull the iris underneath the internal lip of the corneal incision. Now, the key point in this vacuum emulsification is that never allow the chamber to collapse ever because whenever the chamber will collapse, or there is a collapse of the chamber, the vitreous will come forward and the rexus margin which has gone to the periphery will run to the posterior capsule. So in my all cases, I do not allow chamber to collapse at any stage because it decreases the vitreous turbulence. It causes less inflammation because if the iris is not moving and also there are less chances of CME. So this is my routine practice that whenever I withdraw my infusion, I always inject some amount of the viscoelastic from the side port. And this becomes very, very critical in presence of the rexus margin extension and rexus margin tear. And you can see a little bit of a corneal opacity also there. Now I put on a viscoelastic over there before we drying the pore so that the chamber is well pressurized and remove the remaining cortex. And again, before we drying, inject the viscoelastic. So never allow the chamber to collapse. And if the chamber is well maintained, the chances of this excess running out will be much less. So we put on a lens inside and remove the rest of the viscoelastic. Again, inject the air so that the chamber does not collapse. So this is very important to maintain the chamber depth throughout. And whenever we talk of the, curve, 
the excess margin tier, we have got to keep in mind there are two types of excess margin tier. One is a curvilinear, which in a younger patients, when you try to do excess on a routine cases, and another is the conal, like in these cases, an intumescent cataract where it runs away to the periphery. So the chances of curvilinear excess margin tear extending to the posterior capsule are much less as compared to this conal. This has got a very high tendency to run to the posterior margin. And if you can have a uh, jepto, this was a very shallow chamber. Jepto is ideal in these cases, but even in the shallow chamber, jepto is also at times very, very difficult to do. Like in this case, so we make a side port incision. And whenever I do Jepto, I try to stain the capsule so that uh, if by any chance there is any uh, extension, again, you can see that very little air we can inject inside. We paint the capsule well with the uh, tripon glue so that if there is any extension, if there are any tags, if it is not separated, we can do that. Then we put on a Jepto probe and you will see that the space is so much, so less that I am not able to win push the probe to the desired level. When I'm trying to push, it is already holding onto the capsule. So anyway, the, the integrity of the uh, capsular margin is more important than the uh, location. So I'm taking a viscoelastic to separate it from the cornea to push it from the top. Now I was a little scared that if it comes and touches the cornea, we may damage the cornea. So under the viscoelastic injection, I'm doing this gyptorexis. Uh, and once the jeptorexis is performed, then rest of the uh, surgery is completely simpler and it is a routine procedure then. It is the excess margin which is the toughest to do. And whenever there is a cataract is very thick, many times when a chamber is shallow, it may be because of the genular laxity or genulopathy. So in all these patients where the chamber is very shallow, I always put on a CTR ring. Even in a harder cataract, I put a lot more CTR now so that the capsule is really stressed. Iris has started collapsing. So we, uh, if the iris has started collapsing, normally I would not have placed a suture, but in this patient, I placed a suture over there. And the uh, important thing is that whenever you are removing the last fragment, it is very, you can see my chopper is uh, very large and big. And the side port wound, you can see is leaking. So, in whenever you are doing a large, uh, large fragment of a mature cataract, it is very important to inject a viscoelastic to push the capsule back. And if possible, now I have changed the chopper to the blunt chopper instead of sharp chopper. And I crush it into the small piece. My vacuum sitting has been lowered to instead of 500, 550 to 400. And it will be even better if you can remove the chopper from the side port to prevent the leak. So, I, so this is very important when you are removing the last fragment. So, carrying versus peripapal block and massage is very good option in cases of very shallow chamber. Jepto of MTOCC is another good option. A double or triple CCC should be done. And FACO in rexus margin tier never allow anterior chamber to collapse is the key for successful prevention of extension of excess margin tear into the posterior capsule. Thank you, sir, for yeah. making this so difficult. So this talk, looks so I'll simple. just open. So you already, uh, um, it's 12, 18. Actually, you are eight minutes over time. So, would so should I stop it? And... Yeah, I'm okay with it. You want me to stop? I can stop. There's no problem. Uh, because you have it's left okay. only yeah, premium yeah, okay. IOLs, multifocal no, no and coding no yeah, 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 it's perfectly all right. I'll be happy doing that. Uh, initially, in this, uh, in the previous session, there was a talk about choice of IOLs in keratoconus. So maybe you can address that, like for in keratoconus patients, uh, there was a you know back and forth debate whether we should use toric IOLs or not use toric IOLs. What is your view on that? Sir? So there are two points to be kept in mind over here. One, if the patient is used to using the heart contact lens, then you should not use the toric IOL. Okay. If patient is not used to using a heart context, then you should use the toric IOL. 
and explain to the patient they will not see better than what he is seeing with the specs and the toric chiral position should be more guided by the reflection of the patient than the keratometry of the patient that means whatever is the subjective acceptance of the patient is there the lens has to be placed according to the reflection not according to the keratometric value thank you sir for making that point um because we are slightly over time and yeah, yes, dr okay. rup has also joined us uh, yeah. maybe questions for dr uh, harbans lal can be posted on the chat group which uh, he would be able to answer or anybody else who also would like to you know share their can techniques can i have questions after the completion of all the talks there is no problem yeah so let every no, no, if dr harbans wants to continue we can no, i mean uh, because yeah. uh, It's up I to you. I think Doctor Harvey Harvey can uh, take this uh, toric eye oil, no? I, I'll just I will not give my presentation. I'll just uh, highlight two or three points actually. Yes, sir. So, because I, once I go into presentation, it will become very long. Yes, the, yes. The the one is whenever we talk of the toric eye oil, it is the keratometric values are very very important, and the biggest drawback is the dry eye. So you must manage the dry eye. If you see the variability in the readings, you must manage the dry eye beforehand. Who, when you select the IOL power, anterior chamber depth, SIA, all these things are posterior corneal curvature and aging. These are a smaller factor only to be decided. Suppose you are getting IOL which can correct 1.5, then another IOL which is correcting 2, or you are getting 1.75. Then these come into the play. If AC is shallow, they will be more effective. You choose 1.5. If AC is deep, you take 2.25. These are the minor points. When we are putting the IOL during the surgery. the back should not be capsular back should not be lubricated or extension there should be no distension of the capsular back that means you should never use methyl cellulose for putting the iol either use sodium hydronate or do the hydro implantation and after that put the air from the top so that the lens is pressed against the posterior capsule and if there is a myopia the big eye and if you feel there is some where there is chances of rotation of the iol then keep this air for some time full chamber the iol will get stuck to the posterior capsule like oblique placement of the toric iol rotates more so put on a air press it over there and when you leave the uh, patient after hydration the iop should be around 15 or so it should not be 25 30 which you can leave otherwise because then back will be accented so that is about the toric iol and this toric iols do not have any side effect to what so what so far as the you know, multifocal iols are concerned we need to understand that there are many problems and associated with the multifocal iols like glare halos and uh, and a uh, lot of things a lot of issues are there but at the same time there are more happy patients than unhappy patients about the multifocal iol so multifocal iol you need to understand what is the defocus curve and what is the need of the patient so initially the need was distance and near so near need has more or less disappeared because the reading habits have gone down most of the people watch television uh, look on to the laptop and mobile so why it is important because whenever if you give a bifocal which has got a distance and near halos will be big because the near point which is getting focus by the time it reaches the retina the halo is very big so if the halo is big and if by any chance you under correct this patient becomes my pet will even be bigger so whenever you use a high power multifocal iol like simbrinja or the plus 3 at so the target should be emetropia zero power not myopia because then halos will be big and patient will be more trouble so whenever you correct the intermediate vision like a lens of symphony type then the halos and glares are much less and you can target little bit of myopia and can do a mini monofocal so we need to find out the need of the patient and all those like uh, uh, those who are dj's and they working in a night club when pujari are content education anybody who is dealing with the light i mean the welder i mean somebody who is dealing with a lot of light situations we need to avoid them <coughs> and whenever you do the multifocal iol most important point is that you should be able to explant and should not be defensive it's very very important that if you are never explanted iol tomorrow you go into the ot put on a lens cut it and take it out so that you are learned it before hand before hand and whenever you need it because if you are on a defensive if you are not remove the iol you will be very defensive when patient is complaining you tell the patient that you come i'll cut it and remove it i'll put monofocal 
uh, free of cost. They have absolutely no problem. Company will take the multifocal back and in fact will refund you the money. So you get for the second surgery charges as well. So don't worry about it. You can go ahead, but never consult patients yourself because you know too much about the complication of the multifocal. As you need to have somebody else counseling the multifocal, you'll be able to increase your practice of the multifocal. Thank you very much for giving me the extra time. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your so very, very wonderful talks from which we have learned so much and it has made us braver in tackling these total cataracts and heart cataracts. Thank you, sir. And I'd also like to thank all our uh, panelists for this current session. And so now we move on to the next session. And um, so uh, I would request Dr. Uh, Chakravarti to kindly share his uh, screen. Now, just a couple of nights ago, I was you know, looking at uh, at a movie, Southpaw, that's about a boxer. Uh, and his coach is telling him that the fight is in the mind. It is not actually when they are punching each other on the ring. But beforehand, if the boxer thinks that he can win, so he will win. So that is about complex cases. So if we go into the OT and let the complex cases weigh us down in the mind, we have already lost the game. So just to tackle all these complex cases and bring us into a Zen-like philosophy. Into this, we have with us a very, very eminent uh, surgeon, teacher, and a prolific uh, writer, Dr. Arup Chakravarti. I welcome you, sir. I would also like to request the following uh, eminent surgeons from uh, Chhattisgarh, Dr. Nidhi Pandis, Dr. Uh, H.R. Prasad, Dr. Ankur Shivastha, Dr. Likvi Chakravarti, and Dr. Saurabh. Uh, Lutra to kindly uh, moderate this session. They are all veteran cataract surgeons who have seen uh, complex cases in their routine life. So please uh, join us on the virtual dais. And I would like to request Dr. Sharad Gomase, who is from MJMI Institute, uh, to kindly introduce Dr. Chakravarti, Dr. Arup Chakravarti. Thank you, sir. Uh, it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Arup Chakravarti, sir. Uh, Team MGMI Institute Raipur welcomes you, sir, for this wonderful video-based surgical online webinar. Dr. Arup Chakravarti is a senior consultant at the Chakravarti Eye Care Trivandrum. And uh, Dr. Arup Chakravarti was vice president in KOS OS. And Dr. Arup Chakravarti, sir, is holding position of editor proceeding in AIOS. He's recipient of many national and international awards to highlight few of them like senior achievement award by american academy of ophthalmology and asia pacific academy of ophthalmology he is a recipient of gold medal for contribution as a great teacher in ophthalmology by ac and he has conducted many various uh, instruction courses in various national and international conferences, including the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery as a faculty. I won't take too much time. Let's uh, begin the session. And uh, it's, oh, I'm handling this session to Dr. Arup, sir. Sir, we would like to welcome you for this wonderful session. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, my slides is visible? Yes, sir. OK. So uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Deep Shikha and Dr. Samrat and all other uh, uh, members of the organizing committee for uh, giving me a platform to present uh, today. Uh, today, actually, it is the second meeting that I'm doing. And I'm really honored uh, to be here today. So there are uh, a couple of uh, topics uh, that have been allotted. And uh, let me see how much justice I can do in terms of you know, uh, time uh, allotment, et cetera, for each topic. So when I was uh, developing this talk on IFIS, I realized that I don't have any recent videos that show, uh, you know, very graphic or very, you know, very se severe cases of IFIS, which means that I have been employing a proper strategy in managing my small pupil situations, uh, where where I'm able to pick up the cases in the in the right time, and that. Uh, employ adequate prophylactic measures and doing the surgical and employing proper surgical technique. So I let me share my thoughts on management of IFIS in these kind of situations. 
So whenever I uh, come across a patient with a small pupil, I would like to know whether it is the traditional type of small pupil, whether the management strategy is different, or whether it is a IFIS candidate, whether the IFIS type of small pupil. And we all know this was first described in the literature in 2005 by Campbell and David Chang. So all these patients generally were on alpha-1 adrenoceptor adrenal antagonist drugs. And there are other drugs also patients uh, were on, uh, which uh, was uh, giving rise to IFIS in these patients. Uh, some of these patients were hypertensive with shorter axial length, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So my patients uh, routinely give, get this in the questionnaire. All these things are ticked in or ticked out. And these are the various drugs that can be associated with IFIS in our patients. And as regards surgical strategy, if I come across a small pupil like this, or a, uh, or, or a patient has a lot of comorbidities, or an, I have operated the fellow eye where uh, the IFIS was unanticipated and I had issues, then I'll straight away go, go, go with the pupillary devices. My go-to device is the iris hook for various uh, reasons. Now, uh, there are some IFIS candidates which do not come with uh, a small pupil, but you know they have an undilatable pupil. There are a couple of studies in the literature and the cutoff that has for the maximum dilated pupillary, uh, maximum uh, dilated pupillary diameter is, uh, the cutoff has varied from 6.5 to 8 millimeters. So whenever a pupil doesn't dilate beyond, let's say, 6, 6.5 millimeter, you should view uh, these patients with caution and the, the red, red flag should go up. Uh, Pupillary diameter is not, it's quite subjective because there is a lot of individual variation, racial, ethnic variation, it's difficult to measure. So what I do today is take the intuitive pupil to limbal diameter. And let me show you. Now, if this is the limbal diameter of the patient, and this is uh, the limbal, uh, this, is the, this is the pupillary, maximum pupillary dilated diameter, and the ratio is 0 0.58, 58%. So anytime the, this ratio is less than 60%, I consider this patient as an iris, uh, IFIS candidate. So let us see uh, this video. Okay, so now this was a patient, uh, same patient I'd shown you earlier, the, the, the limbal pupil diameter was 0 0.58. Uh, plan is to make a temporal approach, clear corneal incision, uh, phaco emulsification. So inferior paracentesis is the root normal size. The superior paracentesis is small. So you must remember there, there has to be a proper matching between the incision and incision size and the instruments that are going into the eye. So I'm using intraocular uh, xylocard in this patient. And uh, uh, this itself has to be done very slowly because if the intraocular pressure goes up very much and it may result in iris prolapse if your, the incisions are larger. So, so far, so good. So uh, uh, this is the 2.8 millimeter clear corneal incision that is happening. And then this not goes off well. I stained the anterior capsule with trypan blue dye. At this stage, I realized that people have started uh, coming down. So you have to be on your toes now. Use a small uh, uh, I mean, uh, soft shell strategy for this case. That is, you know, first is viscoat, a dispersive visco OVD, and then a cohesive OVD. And it gives you good enough viscomidriasis for you to perform a, a decent rexis. Rexis should not be very large. You know, it should be 5, 4.5 to 5 millimeters in size. Now, during hydro dissection, uh, you have to be very careful. Never perform it very forcefully. Because if the pressure goes up, definitely the iris is going to prolapse out through the corneal incision or whether or the paracentesis if they're large. In this particular case, I was pretty slow, but in spite of that, you see a tenting of the iris in the sub-incisional area. So as I tried to withdraw my uh, chunk and hydrodissection cannula, I did engage the pupillary margin, the iris tissue to a certain extent. Please stabilize the globe with a, with a clear corneal incision. Hold it with the forceps. Normally, we stabilize the globe with the left-hand instrument, but here we don't want to do that because uh, as you enter in the anterior chamber, uh, you depress the posterior leap of the section and the iris may prolapse out because of the pressure gradient. So you have to ensure that there is no such pressure gradient from inside the eye to the external surface. As far as possible, the manipulation should be performed entirely within the capsular bag. Try to avoid performing manipulations or taking your irrigation at the pupillary plane or, or, or uh, behind the pupillary plane, uh, behind the iris. So that definitely results in a lot of undulation, fluttering, and with normal uh, uh, fluidics also, you may have an aggravated uh, IFIS. So people have started coming down and there is a tendency for iris prolapse, but so far so good. And I have ensured that the incisions are not large enough, they're tight fitting, 
and most of the manipulations are happening within the capsular bag or sometimes in the anterior chamber towards the end. So it, need, it is needless to say that uh, viscular OVD, dispersive OVD top up has to be done uh, several times. Uh, if it is a soft cataract, in that case, is this pupillary size will not be sufficient. If it is a choppable cataract, small pupil is okay. So in that case, I might like to use in a pupillary device, maybe an iris hook. So if you want to use an iris hook or a pupillary device, you have to ensure that you spare the pupillary, the rex's margin. So inject a generous amount of cohesive OVD between the iris and the capsule, anterior the capsule, so that as you try to engage the pupillary margin, you don't inadvertently end up engaging the rex's margin. Whenever there's an iris prolapse, you please employ the strategy that I employed just now, used uh, the paracentesis incision and the Sinsky hook or a sacroanalysis spatula to deposit the iris. You don't use the same incision. It doesn't work out and it only ends up, ends up traumatizing the iris. As far as possible, the in and out movement from the eye should be as minimal as possible. You know, because uh, as I've just mentioned, as you come out of the eye, invariably there is a little bit of pressure gradient that is created. And if it is a case of bad eye phase, advanced eye, eye phase, then you know, the, the iris is going to be prolapsing out. So the lens matter is taken out and the nucleus, as I mentioned, is not very difficult to remove. But the problem starts during irrigation aspiration of the epinucleus or the cortex, because then you have to work in the periphery. The limbal, the superior paracentesis incision is enlarged and the cortex aspiration goes on. A bimanual technique definitely is desirable here because you can stretch the pupillary margin and uh, to give you better access to the peripheral cortex. So the, then the instruments can also be switched and remove the cortex as much as, as much as possible. Now, in this particular case, uh, you know, during uh, everything went off fine, uh, but till I came to the stage of IOL implantation, it was a, a single piece hydrophilic acrylic lens. The anterior chamber was uh, shallow as you have seen and the uh, pupil had become uh, small. So I was so focused on avoiding trauma to the iris tissue and corneal endothelium that I didn't realize that the lens is coming out flipped. Had I realized it in the, in the right time, then I would have rotated my cartridge and ensured that you know the flipping does not happen, but it, it happened here. So, but uh, in this particular situation, I didn't want to flip it back. And because it is, I thought it is pointless. Uh, it is a equi biconvex lens, anterior curvature, posterior curvature are the same. This is a zero degree angulation lens. Only thing is the posterior sharp edge, a square edge, which uh, edge which is which is a square edge, is anterior now. So you may you may expect an increased uh, or uh, earlier onset of a PCO in this case. But if I try to flip it back, and uh, you know I may end up traumatizing the iris tissue much more uh, than maybe trauma to the endothelium. So I didn't didn't want to do that. So so far, uh, but for this blemish, everything went up pretty well. And this is the end of the surgery with stromal hydration patient had done pretty well. Or this is uh, the end of the surgery. This is on the day one. Uh, this much of SK is, is, it doesn't make you feel good, but it happened. And on the first post, on this first post-operative week, she, patient was getting a vision of uh, 6, 6 with the correction of minus 0.5 uh, diopter. So I will uh, end here and I'll move on to the next uh, topic. Okay, so uh, vitrectomized eye is something which uh, uh, I do very frequently because my wife is a posterior segment surgeon. So I do a lot of uh, FACO and cataract surgery in patients with posterior segment pathologies. Let me show you this video. So this has emulsified silicon oil in the anterior chamber and the patient requires FACO emulsification. These eyes tend to be soft. So you have to ensure that uh, either the eye is hardened up by in injecting uh, BSS into the eye before you, enter the, before you make the clear corneal incision Otherwise, you'll end up with long incisions. And the long incisions in vitrectomy eyes, highly myopic eyes, will have a deep anterior, anterior capsule is stained with tripan blue dye. This is important because in, not in this case, but in certain cases, you may have capsular fibrosis, anterior capsular fibrosis, so visibility becomes paramount. Use a dispersive OVD. Soft shell technique is my routine uh, technique, OVD strategy for all cases. Because of the presence of silicon oil and prior surgery, the corneal endothelium may not be very, very healthy. Uh, Performing rexes also want us to be careful because there may be presence of you know fibrotic plaques. You see those fully because 
Uh, in certain situations, there might be a trauma to the posterior capsule during the vitrectomy. And if you're not aware, a, a forceful hydrodissection may open up the uh, weakened or open post pre existing or only open posterior capsule. And we may have a nucleus uh, drop into the posterior segment or a complex uh, surgical uh, procedure. Uh, lens iris diaphragm retropartion syndrome or reverse pupillary block is something that has to be taken care of. So, this is what I do. I have gone into the anterior chamber, I'm in position zero. With my Sinsky hook, I'm elevating the pupillary margin, iris anteriorly. So, and then I come to position two. So, this way, there is no pressure gradient between the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber, and there's no excessive deepening that happens during uh, your uh, phaco calcification or during irrigation aspiration. So, this is a very useful uh, strategy. Nucleus disassembly technique depends upon the surgeon's uh, preference. Use any technique that is uh, least traumatic to the capsular zonular apparatus. So in this case, after the initial uh, uh, grooving, I went for uh, chopping. And uh, so uh, once the nucleus is removed, uh, as you see here, the epinucleus is there. And uh, the, there may be an increased incidence of posterior capsular plaques in these cases. For example, patients with long-standing silicon oil in the posterior segment, you know, there can be posterior capsular plaques, which may be, which you may be able to peel off. And sometimes these plaques are integrated with uh, the capsule and the, you need to do a posterior capsular axis in these cases. And sometimes you may have, you know, the silicon oil droplets, emulsified droplets stuck to the posterior capsule and you cannot do anything about it. So these are the various scenarios that you may come across. A capsular polishing, anterior capsular polishing has to be aggressive because these patients have a higher tendency for a, a, a capsular back fibrosis. And this can be minimized to a large extent by removing as much lens epithelial cells as possible. I never use a silicon intracular lens for these cases. In fact, the silicon lenses are not really available in the market today because of various reasons. So you can, you're safe to use a hydrophobic acrylic or hydrophilic acrylic uh, uh, intracular lens uh, in this uh, kind of uh, scenario. Uh, these eyes tend to be soft and you need to do a lot of stromal hydration to have a stable chamber. So it is better to put a suture, stabilize the globe with a suture and uh, so that you don't have to hydrate uh, the stroma too much. You don't have to increase the intracular pressure more than that is necessary. So that is it. That is the end of the surgery and the patient has done quite well. So I'll go to the next uh, topic. Okay, so now uh, subluxated cataracts, uh, we have, I've been doing it for almost two decades now, and I have not really presented uh, for the last two, three years. So this is a cataract uh, which I just edited and I, I, I have not shown it before. So this was a lady in her mid sixties, a blunt trauma, and you can see almost 120 to 150 degrees of zonular dialysis. We also expect weakened zonular status uh, in the rest of the zonules. This is the various, uh, the, this, the, the strategy that I'd follow and not go through it. Now, again, this was taken under peribulbar anesthesia. Uh, initial paracentesis is made. Uh, I, I always use a bimanual approach. So two paracentesis tracks are made. And if you see the previous video, on my previous slide, there was vitreous in the anterior chamber. So there's a knuckle of vitreous that was presenting. So I uh, lose no time in staining the anterior chamber with triamcinolone acetonide, one is to two dilution wash it off and then you can see the vitreous that is present. So here I would like to perform a pastana anterior vitrectomy and not an limbal uh, uh, anterior vitrectomy. So I measured uh, uh, the adequate size distance from the limbus and using the, the trocar cannula system, go to the through the pastana and try to remove uh, the prolapse vitreous as much as possible. And uh, this is a standard vitreous which is severed from its connection in the posterior part. So it can be left alone and during phacomalsification, it can be, you know, another, you know, from the anterior root, it can be removed. So I have removed uh, all the vitreous from uh, this uh, aphakic area, this area that is lacking in zonules, and then uh, injected a dispersive OVD. This is a visco wedge uh, strategy where you use uh, a, a viscoat, a good quality dispersive agent to plug this area. Then use a, a dis. Uh, uh, the, that is a high molecular weight, like something like Helon, Helon 1.4% uh, or Helon 2.3%, Helon GV or Helon 5, and to push the, the you know, to close, to plug the aphakic area. So I measured, uh, I initially made a tunnel, later on I realized that the tunnel need not have been made. 
and I could have just made a groove and gone ahead with the surgery. So the anterior chamber uh, is uh, deepened with a cohesive OVD. Rexis is initiated towards the direction of the zonular dialysis and then it is continued uh, uh, with, the, with the uterator forceps and Rexis went up pretty well, there's no problem. At this stage, I would not like to use a capsular tension ring because it is quite a sclerotic cataract. There may not be much space between the nucleus and the, and the anterior capsule. So the process of inserting a Sionis ring may be more traumatic to the, uh, to the eye, to the, to the uh, capsular bag. So I decided to use three uh, capsular hooks. It's better to use a capsular hook because these hooks, uh, they rest at the capsular fornix and give you better uh, support for the capsular bag. So after the preliminary uh, trenching, uh, I go ahead and start uh, chopping the nucleus and the nucleus, a little bit of anterior chamber phaco is done because the lens matter escapes and then you need to protect the corneal endothelium as much as possible in these cases by injecting uh, a, a dispersive OVD. So the lens matter was removed. Now the question was uh, the residual uh, cortex. So cortex here may be a little difficult to remove and I just left behind a little bit of cortex. Uh, Sioni's ring uh, with the ninoproline uh, is, being, is being used and it will be sutured the bag will be switched to the sclera in this area. Uh, Sevena Gortex is also one of the options. And in this particular case, I used uh, Ninoproline. And uh, so this is uh, init always in make sure that the Sionis ring goes towards the area of the zonular dialysis. You uh, dial it in very carefully, making, make, um, ensuring that it goes into the capsular bag. Uh, pushing in or, in or inserting the hook area may be a little uh, troublesome. So you have to be careful that you don't break it also use a Sinsky hook and subsequently I'll be using a bimanual technique to ensure that the whole thing goes into the capsular bag. As you see here, the, the trailing portion of the, of the hook of, of the Sionis ring is brought into the pupillary area and using the left hand, it is stuck into the capsular, through, under, the, under the anterior capsule into the capsular bag. And then the ring is rotated and so that uh, the, the hook, it comes uh, to the area of the maximum zonular dialysis and uh, it is uh, again using a uh, railroad technique it is uh, uh, sutured into the scleral coat as you see here i'm fast forwarding because there is i mean this is a technique which uh, is very uh, well known to all of us so it is done two times and then uh, the suture is uh, is suture is tied this is the second arm, uh, arm of the suture that is going in uh, the suture is tied and uh, so now it is i decided to use a three piece hydrophobic acrylic lens in this case, one could also use a, a single piece hydrophobic or hydrophilic acrylic lens because the bag is now well stabilized. So uh, leading haptic, make sure that goes into the bag and it's not difficult. You should have the bag well inflated at this time. So the trailing haptic uh, was also tucked into the capsular bag. And before I come out, make sure that there is no residual vitreous. So inject the diluted triamcinone acetonide into the anterior chamber and make sure uh, there's no vitreous or any vitreous is present. In this case, there's no vitreous that came after the initial pass plan of vitrectomy during the surgery. And uh, the, as much of vit, uh, OVD was that was possible was uh, removed from the eye. And uh, this is the end result of the case. And you see a lens that is very well uh, centered. So this was my third case. Do you have time? Do we have time? Hello? Yes, Am I sir. audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yes, yes sir, you sir, are audible. audible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you still have time. Okay. So it's only 12.48, so you still have around 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, we'll include the discussion within that. I'm not able to sum up my present. I'll have to come out of uh, the slide and, and then I have to uh, do it again. Okay. So, uh, so while uh, Dr. Uh, Arup is, now? Arup is uh, you know, doing all these things, uh, anybody would like to make a comment? Dr. Nidhi, Dr. Uh, Sharad? Anybody out here is using anything besides uh, uh, iris soaks because I'm using iris soak and I'm comfortable with it. Uh, anybody uh, amongst the panelists are using a ring? 
Actually, that is what I wanted to ask Dr. Arup. What is his choice of the pupil expanding device in IFS cases? Uh, my yeah. choice, my choice would be to use uh, a iris hook in uh, these cases. Though I have used the ring devices, but with the ring devices also you can have a peripheral iris prolapse that can happen. But with iris hooks, I think that makes it uh, much uh, more con controllable. So I used iris hooks. Uh, you use four of them, sir. No, four, five, oh. and ideally five. Um, uh, one could use four, but ideally one should use five. I personally prefer the Malgan ring. Uh, reason is that you need to make four openings for the iris hook, and takes much more longer. And secondly, there are more chances of uh, trauma to the sphincter because you, if you see the overall perimeter or the stretch on the Pupil is much higher when you use the iris hook as compared to any, uh, whether you use a bhatta charge ring or malignant ring. So, damage to that is more. No, no, actually, if you see the recent literature, sir, if you use the iris hooks properly, five iris hooks and not fully dilated pupil, you know, the results of uh, pupil trauma is much less even compared to malignant ring. Okay. Uh, and secondly, the, of course, ease and comfort of using those rings. I mean, it takes much less time to use them. And uh, I have never found that uh, with the ring uh, iris uh, prolapsing actually. So I've been quite comfortable. And uh, the of course, uh, the, the basic is that there should be least uh, turbulence of the iris. That means when we are doing the trenching, you keep the bottle height say 30 centimeter, 40 centimeter instead of the usually 70, 80. Keep uh, the flow rate uh, low, keep the vacuum low. So, and do not allow the fluid to go behind the iris, which uh, Arup also has highlighted. The, bring the nuclear fragment in front of the iris and then do the trichomulsification. So, <coughs> keep on injecting the viscoelastic and keep press the iris against the capsule. So, so, so that way you can uh, prevent the uh, intraoperative cross-section of the fluid. I will go to the next case. See, I do not, I had all the PowerPoint presentations open, but as soon as I closed one, the third one, everything got closed. Okay, so the next talk is, uh, thank you, Harman, sir, for uh, those lovely comments. And uh, for, I think uh, next topic I'm going to deal with is uh, posterior polo cataract. Again, this is a topic which is very, very close to my heart. And, you know, of course, now there are a lot of literature that is available on it, uh, workup of these cases and, you know, management of these cases. Uh, one thing that the youngsters should remember here that uh, there is a chance of having a posterior capsular drain during all stages of uh, phacomulsification. And in some of these cases, it could be even pre-existing. So my strategy depends upon whether I'm dealing with a soft posterior polar cataract or a hard cataract. So uh, if it is a soft cataract, this is the strategy that I follow. And uh, uh, it is... Uh, Young patient, elastic capsule. So I would like to stay in the capsule again with a, with tripan blue dye. Uh, you have to ensure that your rexis is intact. You know it should be uh, not less than not more less than uh, not more than five to five point five millimeters. Because if you have a large posterior capsular tear and you require the rexis for supporting it, you know for keeping the lens in the sulcus with posterior optic capture, you need to have an intact rexis no hydro steps whatsoever. So what you saw me do was using a cyclodialysis spatula and performing hydro-free dissection from the both paracentesis incisions as well as the main incision. And then I'm trying to create a free space, empty space in the nasal and in the inf on, the, on the central portion, portion of the capsular bag, which is very easy to achieve. And the, in the inaccessible areas, for example, the sub-incisional area, the temporal area or the superior temporal or inferior uh, temporal areas. Now you can always use a visco displacement strategy or just the cyclodialysis spatula to loosen up the loose cortex from uh, the capsular bag uh, from the fornices, bring it down, and then bring it down to a more accessible central area for aspiration. So again, I form the anterior chamber before I come out with my FECO handpiece. Uh, irrigation aspiration is happening. Again, I'm avoiding the central area. Central area, obviously, the posterior capsule is open you know there you can there are telltale evidences that the poster capsule is open uh, i wanted to know whether i should uh, i mean i was wondering whether i should perform a poster capsule but i just thought that there are a lot of clear windows here and there you know so 
I decided I'll just keep a lens in this patient's eye, and if the vision does not improve, I'll perform a ear capsulotomy. So the same strategy uh, can also be used for phacomalsification in any soft cataract. Uh, need not be a posterior polar cataract. For a hard cataract, the issues are different. I'm going to show you two videos. So this is again a man in his 70s, a fellow eye had operated and uh, had no PC rent, and this is the, the current eye. So rexis has been done. So now, unlike the previous case where the lens matter was soft, uh, it is uh, not possible for us to aspirate the lens matter straight away. So I'm going to chisel out a big chunk of the nucleus uh, uh, in this direction, you know, so, so that I basically end up having uh, the, an empty capsular bag in the central and in the nasal area. So the nucleus is, is chiseled off. So this chopping is performed at a more anterior plane. So when you apply lateral separation to your maneuvers, you nothing is transmitted to the capsule, posterior capsule. So even if the posterior capsule is deficient or absent there or, or, or uh, you know, weak there, uh, there is no way the posterior capsule is going to give way. So this is again, the, just turning the FACO handpiece uh, tip uh, towards uh, the upper part. And I got a big chunk that was available uh, that I could uh, divide uh, from the main body of the nucleus and that was aspirated. Now, subsequently, there is a lot of space here. And during phacomulsification, fluid also had uh, inadvertently, you know, performed in hydrodissection. You know, it would have gone uh, under the uh, under the capsule. So it is easy for me to dislodge the, the, the sub-institutional lens matter, just lollipop the lens matter uh, through into the phaco tip bring it into the anterior chamber and uh, perform phaco multiplication. I've been using this technique for, I think, more for the last 15, 20, 18 years, and this has done pretty well. Fortunately for me, uh, this particular case did not have a posterior capsular rent, but this case is going to be eventful. This was, again, another man in his uh, 70s. Uh, I have performed a small rexis, uh, not a large rexis, rather, it's about five millimeters, using a cyclodialysis spatula, trying to separate the lens matter uh, for the anterior capsule from the rest of the lens matter, create a vertical wall, uh, almost the same strategy that I employed for the previous uh, case. So I'm preparing the ground for uh, making a FACO chop. Uh, FACO chop, uh, the lens is elevated slightly, a chop line is created. I don't let it transmit uh, to uh, the opposite area. And then again, the, the FACO handpiece is rotated, another chopping is done. And finally, the lens matter, the, the, the loosened up lens matter is brought into the anterior chamber and emulsified. And uh, we have more space here right now. So the uh, sub-incisional area and in, uh, superotemporal and inferotemporal lens matter could be easily uh, dislodged into a more accessible space and the nucleus was removed. But here, uh, uh, as the, when the nucleus is removed, the anterior chamber was, uh, I could make out that there was a posterior capsular end which is pre-existing injected OVD as I pushed, pulled out on the irrigation, on the FECO handpiece, uh, try to remove the cortex uh, from the peripheral areas away from the PC area, from the area where the posterior capsule is open. But uh, the, unfortunately for this case, the, you know, the, the, there's most of there's liquefied vitreous. So it uh, got flushed out and this posterior capsule rent enlarged in size and uh, there is vitreous disturbance. So one need not really panic. So here after stabilizing the anterior chamber, uh, we injected uh, triamcinolone acetonide. Here, I'm going to perform a, a limbal uh, bimanual vitrectomy. That was done. And with the same system, with the, with the cutter itself, with the vitrector itself, by changing uh, the modality. Like, you know, I, I use a dual linear system uh, in this particular case. So in the irrigation aspiration and bring the cortex in the visible area. And then uh, if it doesn't get sucked out, then, uh, then go use uh, the, some amount of cutting and try to remove as much of the lens material as possible. Other option was, of course, to remove this instrument, exchange them with the irrigation aspiration, and uh, it, it will be more uh, time, combat, uh, time consuming. So this particular arrangement does pretty well. So now I, I change my strategy. I'm going to use a dry cortex aspiration, and that also works out pretty well here. So take a cannula, 27 gauge cannula, and strip off the cortex from the periphery to the center. Instead of trying to aspirate it, you just try to bring it entirely in a more accessible area. And then you can visco dis disperse it, uh, 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 removing, remove it with the aid of a visco in uh, uh, viscoelastic injection. Before I go for the IL implantation again, I ensured that there is no vitreous in the anterior chamber. And uh, so you, you saw me do uh, all these maneuvers from the posterior chamber. Leading haptic has to uh, be placed anterior to the anterior capsule. Make sure that it does not uh, go through the posterior capsule range. It was quite large in size. 
So one has to be very careful. And this is the way to tuck the trailing haptic under the iris. And uh, now the haptics are in the sulcus, uh, which is not a very stable arrangement for the intraocular uh, lens to sit. So since the rex is only five millimeters, I'm obtaining a, a posterior optic capture. There's buttonholing of the lens. So the lens is pretty stable now. You don't have to even alter the intraocular lens power. And the postoperatively, uh, the patient had done pretty well, very well-centered eye, well-centered intraocular lens, and the and the uh, vision also has been pretty good. So uh, this is the end of the, this uh, particular case. And uh, anything, uh, another, uh, I think I have one more thing left, uh, one more presentation left. Uh, do we have time or? Uh, we can take a quick one. Okay, I just show the video, right. Yeah, so this is uh, the last uh, case uh, that I'm going to show you. And uh, you might excuse me for going very fast because there are too many topics to be covered. So this was uh, a case where uh, the anterior chamber, it was already a filtered eye. And anterior chamber was uh, very shallow. You can see peripheral anterior all around, you know, peripheral one third of the cornea, the iris, they're all stuck. It is a mid dilated pupil. And this is the large filtering blip that you see a large peripheral aridectomy. So, uh, here the game plan is you do not uh, do not damage uh, do not traumatize the conjunctival epithelium so don't let it dry use a dispersive ovd i use visco to layer on the on the con on the conjunctival surface including the blade and uh, i thought perhaps if i perform a stretch pupillary plasty i may get a good uh, pupillary dilatation it uh, did not happen now staining the small pupil scenario is little different uh, uh, that i perform in a different way so I plugged the main incision with, uh, with Helon GV and then injected Tripan Blue uh, at this stage so that uh, it directed the jet of Tripan Blue through the, the pupillary margin behind the iris. So in that way you may end up getting a diffuse homogeneous staining of the entire anterior lens capsule. Otherwise you may have just a situation where the, only the central capsule is stained and you, which is about three or four millimeters and you want to make a larger rexis and you don't have visibility there. So, uh, at this stage, I did uh, stretch pupilloplasty and uh, the pupil did not dilate. Uh, bimeridional stretch pupilloplasty was done and it did not dilate, uh, though I followed the proper technique. So I wanted to use an iris hook. Now apply the, the main strategy of using iris hook is, is a little interesting here because uh, see the iris tissue is adherent to the cornea. So I did not try to separate the iris tissue from the, from the corneal endothelium because if I try to do that, you know, there will be far, further trauma to the UVL to, to, to the iris tissue, pigment dispersion, postoperative inflammation, and the blade, uh, which is already functioning. The patient had a good intraocular pressure more than two years post op. Uh, the, the blade may you know, get more fibrosed and it may, it may fail. So I created additional entry uh, for paracentesis incisions through the, through the uh, area of the peripheral anterior sinicia. All right, and then you know, I used the uh, four iris hooks, and uh, that was not subsequently the surgery, of course, becomes pretty easy. You know, you get a desired rexis size, and uh, you see the anterior capsule staining is pretty homogeneous here, so the visibility is pretty good here. And then the lens matter is removed. I, I used a single piece hydrophobic, hydrophilic acrylic lens in this patient eye, and uh, this patient had done uh, pretty well at the end of the surgery. In certain cases, like in, if it is a borderline case, I would like to even freshen up the pre-existing stroma. Pre-existing stroma was lying here. So I would, what I would do here, I would inject a Helon 5 here and then push uh, uh, this in, into the fistula uh, through uh, using uh, injection of OV, dispersive OVD. So make sure that there is not much of flow that happens to the fistula during the phacomalsification. Fec uh, because if you have residual OVD, residual lens matter, cortical material in the in the area of the blade, there may be a chance for further further fibrosis and blade failure. So this patient has been followed up for a pretty long time and has done pretty well. Fellow eye had actually an angle closure glaucoma, so I did a combined surgery for the fellow eye. But here I just wanted to show you 
a patient where uh, a filtering surgery is already done, a big filtering blib, and how you perform, how one should perform a cataract surgery. Uh, to these days, of course, the blibs we are getting are more flat because our, our uh, filtering approach has changed. We are using pain cause modification, larger posterior dissection of the conjunctiva. You don't, you no longer get such horrible looking, you know, elevated blibs. Uh, and uh, but still, with these cases come back to us, operated 15 years back, 10 years back, and we need to be prepared how to deal with these cases in the post-operative period uh, the, the, during the surgery. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very very much for making these complex situations appear slightly less complex. Uh, anybody would like to make any comment? Sir, can I have a comment, two points on this uh, last yes, session? Sure, sure, please, please. So, Aru, sir, excellent presentation. I, I want to add uh, for the surgeons to look for the any posterior capsular touch in vitreotomized eye before going for a surgery, cataract surgery so that uh, you can uh, plan for any unwanted uh, complication of posterior capsular rent or posterior capsular touch during the, uh, during the previous vitrectomy surgery. And uh, second is uh, you have to look for the uh, intermittent fluctuation or deepening of uh, anterior chamber during the phacomalcification vitrectomy eye. So as you have already said in previous literature that we can um, do irrigation or uh, do uh, our irrigation cannula behind the iris to uh, form the anterior chamber more uh, flat or more normal towards uh, during phaco emulsification. These are some excellent points. Uh, Dr. Patel, yes. any rents that I get in a vitrectomized eye, I always attribute it to my retinal colleagues. It is never my rent. It is their touch, whether right. that touch was seen or not. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's right. on a lighter note. That's on a lighter note. Right. Yeah, I would like to uh, tell something about the trap with bleb surgery. So as Arup sir was rightly saying, we do not get such elevated blebs. And the main concern which we have these days is whether bleb is going to fail, say, six months, one year after the cataract surgery is done. So for that, we might plan an internal bleb revision and consider an injection of 5-FU or MMC along with uh, dexamethasone, which we give. Uh, post-op routinely. So this measures we can take to ensure that the bleb does not fail if we are uh, thinking on those lines, if the bleb is not very well formed. Uh, thank you, Lippi. I think I just wanted to show the video because there are a lot of other points that have had to be discussed, but, you know, I mean, in a meeting where the you know, time is short, we don't yeah. discuss. See, yeah, sure. ideally, cataract surgery should be done after the bleb has uh, stabilized, healed. So it yeah. should be two years, minimum two years gap between trabeculectomy and cataract surgery, yeah. uh, not less than six months. In case you do it at an earlier stage, because lens has become intumescent or whatever be, be, be the reason, in that case, of course, you have to be very, very, you know, use 5-FU or mitomycin C injection, all that. And in the certain, uh, this particular case, patient, you know, uh, blade was, uh, filtering surgery was done six, seven years earlier. And I was within, I think, nine or 10 millimeters of mercury. So another high poor indicator for uh, the indicator for poor the intraocular pressure the result after trabic after uh, phacomalcification and bleb die is pre-existing high OP, which means you are dealing with a borderline bleb. The bleb is not functioning well. So in that case, I definitely would like to use five AFU injection on the table and then post-operatively for maybe about a week. Yeah, thank you, sir. This was not about your case. A general comment it was. Thank you. So, um, so, so let us uh, go on to the next session, and that's about complication. Um, let me ask a generalized question to our eminent pa panelist, Dr. Arup, Dr. Harun Slat. When was the last time that you had a complication, a PC rent? Well, uh, So, so uh, what I actually wanted to make the point was that if we are going to operate, we are going to have complications. So there's no surgeon who cannot have not a complication unless he or she doesn't operate. But complication doesn't mean that the case has become complicated. As surgeons, we always expect complications at some point in our time. And we need to be prepared 
to handle the complication well so the case ultimately has a good outcome and doesn't become a complicated one so just to highlight these points i would like to uh, go on to our last session on uh, faco that is handling complications confidently and we have with us another prolific surgeon cataract surgeon dr hari priya arvin uh, who will tell us how to tackle these complications because again we should be prepared for all complications and when complications happen we should deal with it uh, in a very uh, in a manner so that we are able to restore the vision and uh, save a lot of ocular morbidity so for this uh, so i request dr hari priya to kindly share her screen and at the same time i would like to invite dr bp sharma dr dilip lalwani dr shomar roy dr santosh patel dr anil gangwe and dr shashwat behra to the virtual dais uh, and i request dr anil gangwe to kindly introduce dr hari priya arvind and let us go on with our last session on faco emulsification after that we have the quiz session so i kindly request uh, everyone those zoom and those also on youtube to stay on and attend the uh, quiz session sorry priya dr anil please introduce yes thank you sir so on the behalf of mgm institute i welcome all of you and uh, it's my privilege to introduce you uh, to dr hari priya arvin uh, she doesn't need any introduction but as a part of uh, for uh, cme so basically dr uh, hari priya arvin she is actually um, head of cataract and eye services at arvin eye hospital chennai and in addition to that uh, actually she is also looking for the paramedical training at the hospital and is actually involved into the outreach activities so besides doing cataract surgery and being a good cataract surgeon she is also very much interested into the quality assurance among the patients who are undergoing cataract surgery and she has developed a system or tools to uh, monitor the outcomes following cataract surgery so dr hari priya arvin has also been awarded uh, prestigious uh, national as well as international awards at various forums and she has various publications in international and national peer reviewed journals so on the behalf of mgm institute i welcome you ma'am to this cme uh, thank you sir uh, thank you dr samrat and dr deepshika for having me on the uh, in the cme uh, am i audible i don't have a very good throat today but uh, am i audible Yes, ma'am. You are yes, audible. Sir. Yeah, thank you. So I'll be talking on the complications in faco emulsification. So having uh, heard one excellent talk of uh, faco emulsification in different complex scenarios, as was mentioned, there can not be any surgeon who uh, is able to perform complication-free surgery. So the goal, uh, however, is to minimize it to as low as possible to have a goal of complication-free surgery. But in reality, we do have it. so when we do have a complication how do you prevent it you know that is the first goal second thing if it does happen how do you recognize the complication early enough and also do you how do you manage it appropriately so you have the best outcome finally we also have to follow up these patients for any sequelae uh, so the overall goal is to do no further harm so once you have an end how do you uh, ensure this end does not enlarge further how do you ensure you don't have capsule rupture management so talking about wound related complications uh, it's important to have a good structure of the faco incision and to have a good placement site so if the tunnel is a little too posterior on the steel side a big issue could be the conjunctival ballooning uh, at the same time we don't want the wound to be too anterior as well because this will not seal very well it takes a long time for a corneal wound to seal if it is further into the cornea and also there is a higher chance of inducing astigmatism So the ideal site for the incision should be at the limbus, the uh, external uh, uh, incision, and to have it near a uh, square. So you have a rectangle, but as close as possible to a square. That is probably the ideal form of an incision. Having too close or too far away is not a good idea. <clears throat> the sec second thing is the dimensions of the incision. So the ideally the uh, the wound should not be either too narrow or too wide. Uh, at the same time not too long or too short it should be a straight incision if you have a, an oblique incision that is when you enter and come out through a different uh, path then you tend to make a more oblique wound or you tend to make a larger wound if one makes a larger than 
intended incision, then there is a higher chance of wound leak during the phacal emulsification uh, procedure, which means unstable anterior chamber, which means higher chance of a posterior capsule, a posterior capsule rent. Again, having it too tight is also not good. This does not happen intentionally, but if you don't match your sleeve size with the correct incision blade, then you may have a very tight wound, which is also not good because you'll have more stretching of the corneal lamellae and higher chance of wound burn. The other aspect is the tunnel length. A very short tunnel, as we all know, is not good because you'll have this constant issue of iris prolapse during the procedure. There'll be iris chafing and the wound will not seal very well. Again, making it too long in the cornea, like, you know, uh, beyond the square shape is also not good because this way you will have a lot of difficulty in maneuvering your phaco probe and more uh, DM folds and edema around the incision post-op day one and for a few days after surgery. So the ideal tunnel size would probably be about two is to three um, for the tunnel uh, length. And again, like I mentioned, the right place and the right width. So all of this together would give a good form for the tunnel. The other uh, main aspect, most specific to FACO, we are concerned about is the wound burn. And this can happen with the higher energy use. But if you see in this case here, the energy is not you know, unduly high. The soft cat track, the surgeon is struggling to make the uh, initial few trenches. But what happens is if the probe is, if the tip is, is too eccentric within the sleeve, or if you're trying to push the sleeve towards the wall of the tunnel, towards the corneal side, you can have this kind of wound burn, which means there's going to be an issue for this wound to seal post-operative. So here, after phaco emulsification, one will have to go back and suture this uh, tunnel. So this becomes like a big uh, thing. And uh, during surgery, there is no issue, but post-operatively, there will be a big issue in terms of wound sealing. So completely suturing this tunnel is very critical to have a complete wound closure. So one, one has to be careful to not overuse the energy during phaco emulsification to have the wound uh, to be of right size. If it's a very small incision, there's a higher chance of wound burn. Again, to have the phaco tip in the center of the sleeve and not push the tip and the sleeve eccentric in the tunnels. So all of this will also prevent a wound burn. Moving on to capsulorexis. Again, this is a post-silicon eye oil uh, filled eye phaco emulsification. Again, you can see the raised interlenticular pressure, a very intumescent cataract. Uh, and as was mentioned earlier, we need a good more high molecular weight with scholastic is useful when performing capsulorexis here. <coughs> so here, as you can see, because of the raised intralenticular pressure while the viscoelastic was being injected, you can see the capsule excess getting extended uh, on both sides. So this Argentina flag sign is not uncommon, but can be prevented to some extent. Now, if you kind of curve off your initial excess margin and use a good viscoelastic, make a small excess, all of this can help you prevent it. But if you do have an extension, one obviously cannot have a capsule excess, but you can probably enlarge the two uh, sides of the opening to have a more circular capsulotomy. So this will give you enough working space for the phaco emulsification to be done. Now, is phaco safe in this situation? Of course not, but one with very careful uh, controlled phaco emulsification can perform phaco here if the surgeon is uh, confident enough to perform phaco emulsification. So one enlarges the, the capsulotomy on both sides to have enough space. Now, what could be more risky than in this situation is when your excess runs off at one side, the excess is, uh, tends to go out. One will have to, you know, instead of moving forward with your forceps and holding it further away, the tactic you will employ is hold close to the edge of the flap, number one. Number two, instead of moving forward, as you would do with your normal excess, you will move with your forceps backward. The goal, therefore, is to change the force, the, the direction of the flap more centripetal. So the centripetal kind of pull will change the direction of the uh, anterior capsule tear and bring it towards the center of the uh, pupil. So this, once that is done, then one can again re-grasp and continue with a forward movement to complete the, to, to complete the rest of the capsular excess. Now, this is a very useful tip, which, you know, you tip it backwards and this way you will be able to bring your rexes back in most situations unless it is actually not gone out completely. The other aspect is your excess may be too small. Like I mentioned earlier, sometimes trying to make it a little larger has a higher chance of extension. So here, the best option is to do a, 
uh, small lexes and then do a double lexes. So in these instances, uh, one can either use a capsotomy needle or a lexus forceps and make a, a smaller uh, a lexus and then do a hydro dissection. In this case, I have not, but typically it's useful to do a hydro dissection, reduce interlenticular pressure, and then do a double lexus. So you make a small cut with the one hour scissors and then gr grasp the uh, free flap and then enlarge the lexus. So this way you have enough working space. Again, since you've done the hydro before the second lexus, you'll find that the, uh, the, there is the, the need for the capsule to down out of the periphery is much lesser. <clears throat> So at this phase, one will have to use a, a, a rexus forceps, McPherson's forceps to be able to uh, complete the double rexus. Another option for completing, for doing a double rexus <coughs> is to also do it after the lens is being placed. So sometimes this can also be done if your rexus is not too small. Again, the optic can be used uh, as a benchmark for us to uh, you know, know how large or double dexes should be. So once the IOL is placed, a small nick is done and it could be any one quadrant, not all across. So here I wanted it more sub -incisionally. So based on where it is required, one can do a double dexes in that site. So this is a situation in a coloboma case, as we know, again, it's a heart cataract. We know the coloboma uh, uh, eyes have a high chance of rexus extension. Here, the rexus was intact during the initial rexus creation. But as you can see, there is fibrosis here over the coloboma area, and this is not uncommon in eyes with coloboma. And following the hydro dissection, this rexus gave in. So in cases of rexus uh, extension, one has to be very careful when continuing with fake. Now, this case obviously is much higher risk because there's a coloboma, and this uh, probably can go to the PC much uh, faster, considering it's a harder nucleus as well. So during FACO, I found that the wound, the nucleus was not stable, and I wanted to convert it manually, try to collapse it out. But while trying to get it out of the bag, I found the nucleus was trying to sink. So before, without trying any further, I just grasped it with the Sinsky and the second Sinsky hook and sandwiched the nucleus into the uh, uh, anterior chamber. So this is just to say that any rexus extension, one has to deal with care. So if you want to continue FACO, one has, the surgeon has to be confident in dealing with it. But if you continue with FACO, any sign of nucleus instability, please do not hesitate to convert. So here the nucleus is brought into the anterior chamber uh, and then a clear uh, corneal tunnel is created because you, know, you don't want to extend the initial uh, clear corneal incision. So a large seven, 10.5 millimeter serial corneal incision is created and the vectors is used to remove the nucleus out. <coughs> now, in terms of a poster capsule rupture and zonal dialysis, it's important to recognize these complications early. And what are the common signs one would, uh, you know, come across. Of course, one could be the sudden the pupillary uh, snap sign, the pupillary size may change. The anterior chamber may suddenly seem too shallow or too deep because the, 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 this kind of a giveaway of feeling. And this can happen either during FACO or during IA. You can have a sudden bright red reflex in one area. And the followability would be a definite issue. So you will definitely feel loss of followability either with a FACO or the IA step and a peak pupil, and you may actually get to see the dent per se, if you have removed the uh, nucleus. Another important sign is the tilt of the nucleus. So if you find the nucleus equator is within the pupillary area, one definitely has to stop and reassess, because if you have not removed uh, most of it, but if you've seen the whole nucleus, is the, the, the nucleus equator is in the visual axis, it means that there is a dialysis or there's a PC dent. So please stop, reassess, and then proceed only if you're sure it is not a complication. So the step could range from anything from your hydro dissection to your final uh, cortis aspiration stage. So this is a rent which happened during the uh, cracking. Uh, uh, this is a zonular dialysis, which was identified do, during a cortex uh, wash. So just when you're thinking things are okay, you may also find that after the lens implantation, there is a sudden rent. So any step one has to be careful and aware to you know, prevent it and identify it if it does happen. So once the complication is recognized, the main thing is to stay calm for this is easier said than done, but you would need that kind of a balance to be able to judge 
what to do next because the goal may a time for the surgeon would be i know i have to place an iol in this uh, patient so they kind of fast forward the steps in between so it's important to be meticulous and decide how you're going to proceed further so the main thing is to stop phaco and then to reassess the situation reduce your bottle height and then before withdrawing the phaco probe you would like to uh, in, you know inject viscoelastic use viscoat and then remove the probe and assess the situation and kind of have a plan is there vitreous is there nucleus is there cortex is it a rent is it a dialysis uh, and then you know what lens should i have as a backup and then kind of uh, you know you then you take it in a step wise fashion so how you would manage the case would depend upon you know the size of the rent the location is it inferior superior is it large amount of lens matter left is this nucleus there or is there only cortex and is there any vitreous in the anterior chamber so the main principle is normally uh, you would take care of any nucleus matter first and then take care of the vitreous and then do the cortex and then finally plan for the iov uh, and alteration may be if you find vitreous initially itself then you may have to do a vitrectomy of any impending vitreous and then handle the nucleus the cortex and come back to vitrectomy and then place the iov so this is just a case to show you know how uh, a case of uh, a, 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 a pc rent was identified and how this i decided to convert on table so this is like an animation of a patient so it is a simulation where phaco mastication was in progress and during phaco mastication after the first piece was removed a pc rent was noted so in this case i decided to convert so i abandoned the initial 2.2 corneal incision and create a superior sclerotic corneal tunnel <coughs> the reason i chose conversion here is because it's early in the procedure and it's a fairly hard nucleus and a small uh, pupil as well so i abandon the initial wound and create a large regular sics uh, 7 mm sclerotic corneal tunnel at the superior site so i don't even try to collapse the nucleus out into the anterior chamber so i leave that and then i create the corneal valve so extending the uh, original corneal wound may not be good because this will only cause more astigmatism and poor wound uh, healing and higher chance of endophthalmitis now before i try to prolapse the nucleus out into the ac and remove it i'd like to remove the nucleus only i have to have a large enough rexus and large enough uh, pupil so for the pupil i use iris hooks enlarge the pupil then i go back and try to prolapse the nucleus so the rexus is actually made for fake cause so it's a very small rexus uh, and trying to wheel a nucleus out through a small rexus will only cause undue pressure on the posterior capsule especially because there's a posterior capsule rupture so when you have a pc then trying to prolapse a nucleus out through a small pupil or through a small rexus it would only increase the chance of a nucleus drop so one has to ensure your tunnel is large enough your pupil is large enough rexus is large enough and then prolapse so to enlarge the rexus here i'm doing a double rexus so the stain was already used earlier but uh, if not one can either do you know a double rexus or at least relax the rexus at two sides and then try to prolapse the nucleus out uh, here uh, a prolapse is done so first the nucleus is kind of dislodged from its attachments to the capsular bag and then uh, before prolapsing out since the four hooks are in place it's difficult to convert to sics because you won't have space for the nucleus to come into the ac with the four hooks so at least one or two hooks have to be removed and then you prolapse the nucleus out into the anterior chamber all the time being aware that the pc is open that there's a chance that the nucleus may uh, dislocate into the vitreous so be very gentle about it and remove it so you can see the nucleus is kind of uh, uh, incompletely cracked into two halves and before uh, removing it a rectus is used without irrigation and uh, one half is removed first through the tunnel and the reason we don't use irrigation here is because we don't want to uh, enlarge the rent or you know hydrate the vitreous space so we just want to align the second half as well along the tunnel and this is removed with the rectus the same thing is being shown in an animation where you prolapse the nucleus out into the anterior chamber and removed 
And the next step is after the nucleus is removed, I use iris hooks. This is an excellent device uh, to always, you know, see what you're doing. So I would recommend using iris hooks or rings or whatever it is to be able to visualize, you know, where is the end, how, la how large is it, and remove all the cortex. So I'm using the vitectomy probe itself to remove the cortex in the aspiration cut mode. Uh, you can also switch the probe to both the, on both your hands and uh, remove the cortex uh, from across the bag. So you can see a large central rent there. Uh, following this, the iola is implanted with the hook still in place. This way you have a, a deepening of the posterior chamber and the iola will sit in the sulcus comfortably. And once that is done, you can remove the uh, hooks. So the main fundamental is make a large tunnel, large rexus, uh, and then remove the nucleus. So one can consider FACO if the surgeon is confident, but always use lower parameters, lower flow, lower vacuum. That's very critical. So this is such a case where uh, FACO multiplication was done. This is a fairly soft nucleus. Half was removed. There's a uh, rent as is evident here. So I prolapse the nucleus into the anterior chamber gently. Uh, when you're doing phaco emulsification, use slow motion phaco and do the phaco. Because this is exactly opposite the site of your incision. So that's where you tend to do the phaco, but try to have your probe slightly away from the area of the rent if possible. This way you will prevent uh, any ch chance of uh, rent uh, enlargement uh, or which is prolapse. I'm using the probe here to remove some epinucleus, but one, I think it's much safer if one goes back to the uh, bimandal irrigation aspiration or the vitrector to remove the epinuclear bowel and the uh, cortex as well. So you need to have a very stable chamber, slow motion phaco, lower uh, vacuum settings. Uh, before the IOL is placed, the cortex is aspirated. Here I'm using a bimanual uh, probe for the cortex aspiration. Remove the cortex first at the site away from the rent and then go to the rent area in the very end. Uh, finally, before the lens is I'm doing a vitrectomy. So bimanual vitrectomy. Vitrectomy has to always be bimanual. And you'll have to place the cutter over the area of the rent. So you remove any vitreous which is there in the anterior chamber. So the vitreous can fall back into the posterior chamber. I intend to place the lens in the bag. So I'm extending the wound a little more. So there can be a wound, there can be a bag placement of the lens instead of a sulcus placement. So I take the lens close and place the eye oval close to the, uh, just below the anterior capsule in the bag with the haptics away from the PC rent area. This way the haptics are well supported. And finally, the viscoelastic is aspirated. So this other case is uh, again a case with a pre-existing rent uh, in a, a patient with a traumatic cataract. So this is the same principles one would follow. So I'm doing a visco dissection here. So you don't have to do hydro dissection. You can do visco dissection that will help you prevent enlargement of the rent and then do very gentle aspiration. Like I said, have the probe away from the area of the uh, rent. So further away, it's better. And finally, before once you're do, done removing all the lens matter uh, and before the probe is removed, always inject. In my case, I inject viscode, but use a good dispersive viscoelastic and seal this rent. This is really helpful to prevent any rent enlargement. Otherwise, you'll find that this can actually extend uncontrollably. And here, because it's a larger rent, I'm placing the IOL in the sulcus. A three-piece IOL is always the option for the lens for sulcus placement. If I'm placing for bag placement in a piece rent, I always go in for a single piece lens because it's more capsular friendly. One can also choose an IOL to support you in case you find that you're, you know, you're, uh, you, this is, the dent is too large and the piece may, you know, drop in the vitreous. One can choose placing an IOL in the anterior chamber and then doing a phaco emulsification. In this case, my wound was already enlarged, so I couldn't do a phaco here. So I manually removed this hard fragment out of the tunnel. And once the nucleus is removed, one can go back and dial the lens to the sulcus. So a spake was careful technique works well. Uh, so some of the principles of anti vitectomy always do bimanual, always do to the side port only, never to the incision and have your irrigation above in a vitectomy probe towards more, you know, with the cutter face towards the rent area. So you cut all the uh, impending uh, vitreous. And you can also choose to use times alone. So times alone, 
uh, I, I normally use in the ratio of one is to uh, three or one is to four. And this can be used before you do your vitrectomy. So this has to be used repeatedly until you're sure that all the vitreous is removed from the anterior chamber. So you will have to remove all the vitreous from the AC, but don't go further into the posterior segment and remove the vitreous. That is not required. Of course, if one does a pass file of vitreous, that is the best option. But I, I, I normally remove vitreous from the anterior segment. And it is a safe option as long as we're not pulling from the vitreous base. Uh, base. There's no traction. So one should not pull on the back sponge and cause traction on the vitreous base. So remove all the vitreous, which is in the anterior segment. We have two modes on the vitrectomy machine, the IA cut or the cut IA. So the vitrectomy mode is the uh, cut IA, where in position two, you have the cutting, and position three, you have the aspiration. So you cut the vitreous first, and then aspirate the cut vitreous. Whereas if you're removing cortex, we have the IA cut mode, where in position two, you aspirate. So you aspirate any residual cortex, this is normally what you would do after you've done the vitrectomy. After the vitreous is, is cleared off the antechamber, then you go on to the IA cut mode, aspirate the cortex. In case you find the vitreous prolapsing, you can go to foot position three and cut what little vitreous is prolapsed. So in terms of setting, for example, with one or two machines, the same settings are used, except that your cutting is normally higher in your cut IA because you want to cut the vitreous, that the goal is that. So you have your highest cut in the machine can offer. Whereas the vacuum is always on the lower side, vacuum and flow rate. In an IA cut mode, your goal is to maximize the vacuum. So based on the probe size, you can set your vacuum setting and you can have a much lower cut rate. So cortex aspiration is the next step. So I would use either the vitrectomy probe or the uh, irrigation by manual or the coaxial uh, irrigation, depends upon the presence of vitreous. But uh, the sim calls is a great device. When I'm using the Simco for cortex aspiration, I don't use any irrigation. So I use Visco after every attempt of cortex aspiration. So I uh, aspirate out the vitreous and, you know, the, uh, sorry, the, the cortex, and then I would flush it out and open up the irrigation outside the eye, but not within the eye, I only use Visco. This way the chamber is always formed and there is no enlargement of the um, dent. And then finally the IOL is placed uh, on axis. Uh, in terms of IOL placement, some of the basic uh, principles are, for me, if I have an intact rexus and it is a small PC tear, I would like to place the lens in the bag. And if it's a single piece lens, is what is the best lens for in the bag placement. If the intact rexus with a large rent or there's a, a can opener with a small PC tear, you can think of sulcus placement. In sulcus placement, you always should choose a three-piece IOL, a foldable or PMMA. And if it's a large PC tear or there is inadequate anterior and posterior capsule support, we'll have to think of other alternatives like anterior chambers, serial or iris fixated IOLs. So one principle, like a, I think the biggest recommendation for using iris hooks, even if not in FACO, is to use hooks when you have a complication. After you remove the vitreous, because this way, if you can see, you will know how big is your rent, is the cortex all removed. Uh, that is, and also you will also have your iris lifted so you can place your uh, IOL comfortably in the sulcus. Otherwise, if you have, you know, typically in most of these complication, uh, eyes with complications, you'll find your pupil has constricted it, at least to five millimeters. So it's, 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 it's almost impossible to manage it completely or properly when you're having not, you don't have good visibility. So iris hook is a great, I think the most important tip I would request you to take from today's talk is to use an iris hook when you have a complication after the vitreous is managed. The other option is to use Kuglin's hook. Now, in this case, the, actually the eyeball was supposed to be placed in the sulcus. Uh, it is a foldable lens, but a, a rigid haptic design. But the surgeon, instead of placing it in the sulcus, has placed it in the back. And because the rent was large, the eyeball had decentered. So I bring the eyeball first into the anterior chamber and then dial the lens into the sulcus. So if you have a small pupil and don't want to use iris hooks, the other option is to use a Kuglin's hook or a wide hook and retract the iris completely up to the fornix and then dial your leading haptic and a trailing haptic as well. Uh, both the times you retract the iris completely, ensure you're placing it in the sulcus. Uh, that way you'll uh, ensure you have good stability of the IOL in the post-operative period. Uh, this is a patient with the posterior capsule rupture. Again, uh, during phaco emulsification, the rent was visible. So this is a patient who had a, congenital posterior capsular uh, dehiscence. 
Uh, and uh, this, the goal here is again not to enlarge the rent. So this is the rent here. So again, before the probe is removed, the score is uh, injected, uh, the rent size is maintained. And for an IOL placement, like I said, ensure the leading haptic and trailing haptic are safe away from the rent area. And also this single piece is very capsular friendly. You can just flex the haptic and release. This way, instead of dialing, that will make your rent also exit uncontrollably. So if a surgeon is comfortable, one can choose to place a single piece in the bag or a safe option definitely would be to use a three piece foldable lens in the sulcus. There is some plaque on the PC, which is uh, aspirated before the IOL is finally uh, left centered in the bag in this case. And this case is basically a PC rent, but a fairly large rent here. So normally I would recommend having a lens space in the sulcus for this rent. But if one does want to place a lens in the bag, I'll just show you a systematic you know, approach to this case. So first is to do a good vitrectomy by a manual. Second, because the rent and the excess margin are almost the same size, it's not a good idea to try and uh, insinuate the lens through uh, this uh, small opening. So I would recommend having a double rexus. So for double rexus, I would have a, a iris hooks there. So you can see the rexus margin well. And then the anti-capsule opening is much larger. The next factor is to place the lens in the bag. I would like to go take the haptic as close to the bag as possible and to place it in the safe zone, this zone where the PC is intact. The haptic has to be in the safe zone. So I would take it and the trailing haptic also is then uh, placed in an area where the PC is present. Um, and uh, finally, the cortex is removed and the hooks are also removed. So the final closing is make sure the pupil is well-rounded, it's not stuck anywhere with vitreous, use uh, pilocarpin and postoperatively, these patients have to be managed very closely. The IOP has to be managed, the NSAIDs have to be given to prevent any CME, look for floaters, look for a retinal, uh, ask a retinal colleague to see the patient in the next few visits if possible, to check for any vitreous, any lens matter in the vitreous. Uh, you may have to disclose to the patient that you've had a complication. More so if you've had retained lens matter, a fakia, a different IOL is placed, or there's increased IOP or inflammation. So it's very important to have it a transparent, open uh, communication. So the patient can actually trust you even after you've had the complication. Because once you've done your bit and managed the complication well, the, these patients can actually do very well post-op uh, as well. So in conclusion, when we prepare in advance for a complication with a comprehensive strategy and we treat the patient with logic, we can often achieve optical, uh, optimal outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Haripriya. That is a very, very comprehensive and so systematic management of complications. Uh, before the panelists ask any questions to anybody, uh, what do you tell the patient when they ask, how did this PC rent talker. So what do you tell them? Like, uh, So I think one thing I find is the patients actually, uh, you know, you'll have to tell them, they, they normally don't ask you, you know, why did it happen? But you, most of the time there could be some pre-existing complication, but you just have to tell them there's no pre-existing complex feature. You just have to tell them that this can happen. It's not common, but you know, once in one in hundred surgeries, you can have a complication, but it's fine. Things have been managed well, and we'll follow up and give you the best uh, option. So we in also in patients with all complex scenarios, we have an additional consent form called as the guarded visual prognosis consent form. So all patients with posterior polar cataracts, uh, NS3 to 4 cataracts, mature cataracts, all of them, we have an additional consent form, which we give to these patients to ensure we have told them that there is a risk of a complication during surgery. Thank you, Dr. Haripriya. Anybody would like to make any uh, uh, additional comments or any yeah. uh, quick strategies for- I just, um, uh, in, the, in the same context, uh, I think Haripriya's talk was- ex ex uh, Dr. Dr. Samrat. Can you hear me? Like you asked the question that, uh, do we, uh, what uh, when there is a PC lane to the patient, is it required or is it a must to tell the patient they had a PC rent? See, I was I a question to Dr. Uh, I was just addressing the same issue. See, uh, no amount of consent that you take uh, is going to protect you from, you know, the patient's fury. If if postoperatively things were to go wrong, 
and patient has not been adequately primed about it. So I think the best strategy, whether you're dealing with a simple case or whether you're dealing with a complex case, which may be complication prone, is to have a very frank discussion with the patient, what all things could go wrong. At the same time, we also tell the patient that, you know, it is very, very unlikely that things will go wrong. And this is what our track record is. But I would like you to be aware that things could go wrong and you should be mentally prepared for, you know, maybe another surgery for a, or different intracranial lens type. And it is always useful to, it is always necessary that you have a frank discussion with the patient. May not be at the time of the surgery where when the complication happened, because I, we happen to do a patient uh, sometime back where patient says that sir, the operation is going on and suddenly surgeon did whoosh, ayu, ayu, like that. You know, so that should not be done, but that does not mean that you will not reveal what has happened. So it has, the news has to be broken very gradually, but completely in a very human way after the surgery is over. After having prepared the, primed the patient preoperatively, that complication can happen to any human being. I think, I I think these are some very important tips of soft skills that are very important, which actually we are not taught in medical school, how to, de how to disclose a bereavement, how to disclose a complication. These are soft skills that probably we need to develop and have some maybe, you know, talks on how to deal with such complex uh, situations. I uh, Dr. Can I say something? Yeah, can yes, you hear sir, me? Please, please. Yes, sir. We are audible. So I 100% agree that you should tell the patient immediately. There are two reasons. One that our three-piece IOL package is less. Suppose patient was planned for toric, you didn't put on a toric, why should charge for the toric IOL? One. Secondly, if you tell the patient immediately, then you got a peace of mind. You are relaxed because you already informed the patient. So next time patient comes, you're not tense about it. So for your own peace of mind, and most of the time, because these patients are going to be all right. Not unless, even if you had a nuclear drop, a cortical drop, a nuclear drop, even if you feel that the patient is going to have a post-op coronary edema because you operated heart cataract, the pupil was a small. So you can tell the patient that it will take a little longer because we need more FIFO energies. Your brain was a little weak. It could not withstand the bombardment. You will have a little more information will settle down. You have a coronary edema. So it's better to inform the patient. You will be relaxed. Other patient, because you operated 10 patients, only one patient is having a problem, all other patients are seen, so he'll be worried. So I think the patient is also more relaxed if you tell him truthfully, and patient will sense you are not truthful. If patient comes, even if you are not informed him with your face reading, he will read your face and will understand that something is not correct. Doctor is not happy seeing my eye as he should be. We are very I, I personally, I personally inform all patients immediately or first post-op day whenever I see him. I think the, you know, the bottom line is it should not come as a bolt from the uh, blue for the patient. So a toric patient or a multifocal patient should be pre-informed uh, before surgery itself that on a rare situation, if there's a complication, we may abandon our original plan and have a backup plan. So if it comes as a bolt from the blue, that patient wasn't aware everything uh, about what could go wrong and suddenly it has happened then you may face a lot of unpleasant moments dealing with not only the patient, but the bystanders and their, you know, the community in, at large. So, you know, I think everything that, is... That is absolutely ideal, provided uh, you have enough of time and your counselor is smart enough to explain that. No, no, time is not an issue, sir. Time, I mean, when the patient <laughs> comes, you have too much, so much faith and comes to me. <laughs> I can't say I'm not of time. So then, I mean, I may not do it personally. No, I, 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 I'm not disagreeing with you, but most of the time, the uh, you may not have that much time to tell the patient what all can go wrong yourself. Counselor does the job. You know, a well-trained counselor uh, can uh, do the job. Like recently, as Samrat was asking, uh, did you have any complication? See, uh, after the COVID last year, when the thing opened up, I started doing a lot of uh, very advanced cataracts. So there's one patient where I could not place a lens. You know, we had to take up the whole nucleus uh, had been taken out, but patient is uncooperative. So I, I scheduled the patient for two-stage surgery and patient already knew mentally that this could happen and, you know, so he's ready. Second patient I had was a small chunk of the nucleus. I have never dislocated a small chunk of the nucleus, you know, maybe last 15 years or so. Uh, so it just happened. I brought it to the notice of the patient. And the whole community, whole whole, they were very, uh, they were very anxious. But they knew that something could, you know, this kind of complication would happen. I followed up the patient for two months, and patient has six weeks uncorrected. 
you know but uh, you have to face it you just cannot uh, you know be you know uh, you know be i'm just suppose opposite of you i never tell anything to the patient i said god has been kind to me so far and will be kind in your case hopefully there should be no complication that's what i and say you go home you go home you can accident same way something can go wrong but be assured even if something go wrong you will be able to take care of it so i don't go into that in detail about explaining to the patient much because so that i want my patients to remain calm and not to be worried about it so any anyway i think what that is so for medical legal point of view i think arup chakravarti has got a better approach than mine no even even humanitarian angle also sir we also tell the patient that we can manage each and every complication that can happen but it can happen i think i think i think the uh, i think the bottom line is that transparency number one second pre counseling in complicated cases thirdly and if it happens then uh, you know you need to break it gently and uh you need to have a support system like uh, yeah. in 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 a multi specialty uh, uh, i sub specialty like in our place we have the retinal surgeons so that's a big help to us and i acknowledge that without the retinal department uh, it would be very difficult for us to take up some advanced uh, and complicated cases so if one does land up with a complication then uh, as dr haripriya has uh, already pointed out the strategies we need to take those so that the and if we can't um, what i mean to say is that suppose something we can't handle suppose a, a nuclear fragment has gone in we don't have a in house retina surgeon at that point it is better to close up the case put some sutures and tell the patient that this this patient needs to be uh, sent somewhere else for that and then communicate with the retinal surgeon now this so i think these are some steps that we all can take and uh, i would like to thank all all our um, uh, faculties for their excellent talks in in all the three like in the routine cases the complex <laughs> cases and the complicated cases so thank you all sir and uh, i also thank the panelists for this session for their uh, uh, moderating the session and all the uh, viewers for their questions now we have come we have done the learning now it is fun before uh, my invitation for lunch so really? now we have the quiz and and i would i would uh, invite dr monali sir to tell us about the quiz how we all can participate in that uh, and i would also request everybody to participate in the quiz we have some exciting prizes so dr munali sir it's yours now okay bye bye thank you sir so uh, i would like to welcome all of you to the quiz and uh, can we have the screen please okay so uh, there would be first a uh, few demo quiz before that i would be telling you few instructions about the quiz and few rules of the quiz then we will have two demo questions uh, so uh, so that to make you all prepare for the main quiz all right so now uh, next slide please okay so you can uh, open another browser on the same device if you are using only one phone or you can have another device and open one web browser no need to leave the zoom meeting you can stay in the zoom meeting and in the background you can open another browser and in that browser you just type the slido.com or you can uh, click on the link which we have already shared in the chat box it is quite easy just click on to the link and uh, this uh, page will be open in that page you have to enter the game pin that is also been provided in the chat box then after entering the game pin you will be able to join the quiz and i would like to request all of you to write your real name no nicknames please and you enter your email id okay uh, so now i would like to tell you few rules of the quiz there will be total 20 questions and the quiz format is multiple choice questions for each question there will be four options with one correct option so you have to choose the correct option and press the right answer key 15 seconds will be given to answer each question so you have to press the right option key as well as you have to be quick enough to answer the question so scores will be given on the basis of, of the right answer and on the basis of the time taken to answer the question 
okay so in this uh, 15 second timer time you can change your option if you want to but once the timer is stop then the last key which has been pressed it will be considered as your final answer at the end of the quiz three best scores will be awarded so there will be few demo questions now to get you familiarized with the process no scores will be given no please go back go back to the rule page only okay so no score will be given for the demo questions so after each question uh, you can see the right answer on your screen uh, along with the number of people answered the uh, right answer then after each five question you can see the leaderboard with the names of the leading scores okay so now can we have the demo questions please okay so we'll wait for few minutes couple of minutes then we'll start the demo question i hope everyone has downloaded uh, i have downloaded the app i have i hope others have too yes i hope everyone is now ready for the quiz already logged in to the slido page it is actually quite simple process just click the uh, this link which is already there in your chat box and put the uh, game pin and join for the quiz game pin is 9537755 i repeat game pin is 9537755 okay so i hope everyone is already ready for the quiz now we can have the demo questions the first demo question go to the question well so which state is called rice bowl of india is it kerala bihar chatisgarh or uttar pradesh timer please all right so the right answer is chatisgarh okay so uh, actually nobody has joined yet so i request everyone to please join in for the quiz Uh, is is anybody facing any problem in uh, accessing? So they can just uh, say, okay. Uh, some people have joined. Okay, so we can wait for a few more minutes. Actually, we have start. answered, but uh, the thing is that uh, we can see us, all the answers. Yes, we can see. Actually, we have uh, the type your question. We have uh, put it into the type your question thing. So uh, okay, where do they need to? uh put the, the actually the demo question was not seen in this okay go to the second demo question okay so we'll go to the second demo question where we have to give answer like because here the type of your question that's all uh, answer has to be given in slido no slido is fine Uh, I have opened this, but uh, there is nothing. On the slido page only, madam, you have to uh, type the right option key. Just click on the right option key. There is A B C D. If uh, C is the right option, then you just click on that. the. 
no no we are not seeing that page. yeah that is not seeing because only the type your question is there it's and a question uh, and answer it is showing yeah question and answer is showing and if you are clicking that that is uh, in polls okay so we'll find out we'll find out that okay so we are trying to fix the problem question is actually not visible in the slide of app yes question is not visible okay, basically so, that is like a chat box okay we are trying to fix the problem we can start the next slide demo slide so let's oh, see just keep us on the demo slide. you you have to keep the uh, slido page open you cannot go to the background or use any other app or any other page so keep it active the stay slido, on the slido page yes keep your slido page active on your mobile or your uh, web page now we can go to the next uh, slide demo slide can we have the next demo question please yes ma'am just just one minute uh, share your slide so while answering for the quiz you have to stay on the slido page the questions along with the option it will come on the uh, this slido page along with the timer so uh, when this timer is running in that uh, time you have to click on the right option if it is a b c d then uh, you have to choose one option and click on that so please note that you have to see the zoom also for the questions and the images or videos shown and you have to see your uh, mobile app slido there you will have the questions to just select and put the answer so get ready yourself just don't uh, try to switch uh, uh, pages from slido to some other so that when you are back again to slido it may not uh, show you the question at uh, in the real time so just keep your slido app open till the quiz is over now we have got the page the question is uh, which state is called rice bowl of india Kerala, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Uttar Pradesh. So, is this question is visible on the slido page or not? No. No. Next. 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 When the timer starts, it will come. Okay. Now so you. Now is it question. visible? Yes. Okay. So. I think now we it is now asked us to get yes. ready. Yes. Now yes. you see all the participants' name. so you are ready now just keep the page open always you cannot go back or put it down okay 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 you cannot get the real time question yes Respect now there are 32 32 people yes yes so this is just the joining names which have been given participants next slide will be your timer for the question so be ready everybody to poll it next question please now the timer starts yeah you have 15 seconds just put the option and put send click on send you can change in between the timer till 0 seconds now it is coming yes yes now you see the results of it this is, uh, the third okay. result is the uh, correct answer so see is the correct answer and 97% of uh, you got the right answer good one more thing if you you see a thumbnail picture in the uh, page you can also click on that zoom uh, icon you can see a bigger picture if you want to just see the question and the options also so just uh, click on the zoom uh, icon on the photo what you see there and you can see the uh, big uh, questions and the options if you are forgotten so this is the uh, process to do that's all it's very easy just keep your uh, app active do not go to the background don't switch apps during this uh, quiz process okay
Okay, right. so I hope all the doubts uh, have been already clear. So can we go to the second demo question, please? Okay, so in the Tokyo Olympic 2021, India won gold medal in which game? Is it hockey, badminton, boxing, javelin throw? Now please start the timer. So now you will be able to see the question and options on the slider page. And please answer the question. One more note, the fastest finger will be getting the prize along with the maximum number of correct results. So be quick and fast with the correct answer. Okay, that's great. D is the right of the right answer, and ninety-seven percent of you got the right answer. That's great. Okay, All so watching the Olympics. Okay, so okay, now you uh, get the. Ah, she is the one. She is the uh, leading one, but uh, this is actually demo question. We are not giving scope for this demo question. Now we'll start the main quiz. So all are ready for that. Hope all are uh, logged in. with their slido on so don't switch the slido app keep it active and you will see the questions real time all right so can we have the questions please first question Okay, so it's taking little long time to share the screen, Mr. Rohit. Okay, all right. So first question: Which of the following can be used in case of posterior capsular tear? Is it capsular tension ring, capsular tension segment, Schoeni ring, all of the above? Next. Please start the timer. Okay, so B is the right answer. That is capsular tension segment. Only nine percent of you got the right answer. Actually, all of the above. Uh, this option was only to trick you, and you all got tricked. Almost sixty-nine percent of you got tricked. So uh, actually, in MCQs, when there is option for all of the above, so the rule says that go with the option. But sorry, we don't follow that rule. Next quiz. Yes, CTS is used in case of anterior capsular and posterior capsular tear because it does not generate 360 degree expansive force. Second question, please. Okay, so identify the B scan image seen in patient on post-operative day two. Please look at the B scan image and answer the question: Is it retinal detachment, vitreous detachment, choroidal detachment, or vitreous hemorrhage? Please start the timer. Okay. So eighty-five percent of you got the right answer. The right answer is choroidal detachment. so nice to see that okay so a uh, we cataract surgeon we don't like to see any echoes in the b scan image but our retina colleagues they love to see all these echoes in their b scan image so actually this is a uh, choroidal detachment it happens following hypotony uh, in case of intraocular surgeries uh, so uh, in this case uh, you can say it is kissing choroidal or near kissing choroidals because two big choroidals are there uh are just into each other okay so go to the next question please what is the name of the dutch ophthalmologist who developed snellel chart 
So there are many Snellens in the options, Richard, Albert, Herman, Eric. Please start the timer. Remember, the Slido has an app where they can detect if you are Googling the answer. So no one should Google the answer. We'll also publish a list of people who have been Googling the answers. And you'll be not eligible it's for the excellent. prize. Excellent. Fifty-two percent of you got the right answer. The right answer is option C. Herman Snell. Excellent. So go to the next question, please. Clinical triad of pendular nystagmus, head bobbing, and torticollis is known as rebound nystagmus, periodic alternating nystagmus, Bruns nystagmus, or spasmus Newtons. Timer, please. Excellent. 59% of you got the right answer. The right answer is Pasmus Newton's. Uh, so uh, yes, it is difficult to examine a patient of uh, nystagmus. When we examine a patient of nystagmus, our head start bobbing. So uh, in spasmus nutrients, uh, we see this patient, uh, this uh, condition in first year of life and it disappears by uh, three or four years of life. Uh, sometimes it is associated with glymus. So you uh, should order uh, neuroimaging for these patients. Next question, please. Okay, so enough for Papa Mukherjee. What is the language of this song? Tamil, Singhala, Malayalam or Bangla? Please start the timer. Okay, so uh, that's pretty good to see 39% of you got the right answer. The right answer is Singhala. Though I don't understand this language, but this song is excellent. The music is excellent. So now who is leading? Dr. Bharat is leading. And followed by Dr. Anupam and Dr. Alka. Next question, please. Mercedes Benj. Okay, so Mercedes Benz symbol, uh, like splitting of light, it can happen in high order aberration. So, identify this high order aberration. Is it spherical, comma, or piston or trifoil? Please start the timer. Superb to see that 60% of you got the right answer. Okay, so Mercedes Benz symbol, it is nice on the curve, but it is not nice if, it, if a patient is seeing it. So it's a type of higher order aberration uh, where the light is splitting uh, like Mercedes Benz symbol. Next question, please. Okay, so please carefully look at this uh, fundus picture, bilateral uh, uh, fundus picture of one patient. And the below image is the OCT finding of one of the eye. And name the retinal condition. Is it macular BRVO, radiation retinopathy, juxtafoveal telangiectasia, or choroidal neovascular membrane? Please start the timer. <laughs> So 
Super. 86% of you got the right answer and it is juxtaposed telangiectasia. here. Well, so in the early phase, you will see gray uh, patch on the macula. And uh, if you do OCT, then you will see this cavitation-like changes because of loss of retinal layers. And the most common complication associated with this condition is CNBM. Next question, please. Well, lattice growth serum, it contains letanoprost, bimatoprost, travoprost, or tafuprost. Please start the timer. So all these are anti-glaucoma medications, by the way. So it's quite interesting to see anti-glaucoma medication in growth serum. Can we have the answer side, please? Please go to the answer slide. Mr. Rohit, is there any problem? Mr. Rohit? Okay, so... Uh, actually, the answer is bimatoprost and 28% of you got the right answer. So, uh, actually, the side effect of this drug, it is used for this cosmetic uh, purpose. So, one of the side effects of bimatoprost is lengthening of eyelashes. Uh, so, it, it's a beauty tip for all the girls over there. So, you can follow this if you want to. Next question, please. Okay, so please carefully look at this picture, the fundus photo and FFA imaging of a 24-year-old female presented with decreased vision in both the eyes. What is the diagnosis? Is it Besset disease, ocular sacoidosis, Wachowski herrera disease, or primary intraocular lymphoma? Now you have to uh, you have to do the diagnosis. You can't get any tip from your retina colleagues. All right, eighty three percent of you got the right answer. So this is Vogt Kuanegi Herrera disease. In the Vogt Kuanegi Herrera disease, you see multifocal exudative RDs. And uh, in the FFA early phase, you will see multifocal pinpoint like leakages. In the late phase, you will see pulling of the dye in the neurosensory area of detachment. Can we go to the next question, please? Papu can't dance. Okay, so according to this song, what brand of perfume does Papu wear? Is it Prada, Gucci, Armani or Chanel? Please start the timer. One important disclaimer, this is only for entertainment, nothing to do with in politics. All right. So Gucci is the right answer and 63% of you got the right answer. So this is a song from the movie Jane Tu Ya Jane Na. So uh, leaderboard, Dr. Anupam is leading, followed by Dr. Bharat and Dr. Alka, Dr. Sarad and Dr. Dharmeshwari. They are at uh, fourth and fifth position. Please go to the next question. Well, so all the girls must be wondering why Tom Cruise picture is here. 
So this is a picture of Copernicus, Galileo, and Cruz. Actually, these names, uh, these are the names of two studies which uh, of one ocular disease. So identify this ocular disease. Is it optic neuritis, diabetic retinopathy, retinal vein occlusion, or open angle glaucoma? Please start the timer. Well, so 56% of you got the right answer. It is retinal vein occlusion. Please go to the next question. Okay, so these are pictures of cataract, the snowflake, oil droplet, and shield cataract. So in which order, in which of the following order, snowflake cataract, oil droplet, and shield cataract are associated with systemic diseases? Is it diabetes, galactosemia, and atopic dermatitis? other option containing the same choices but in uh, different orders so please go through the option and uh, mark the answer please start the timer i must say cataract pictures are very beautiful though the patient is not very happy to have it Superb. 84% of you got the right answer. The right order is diabetes, galactosemia, atopic dermatitis. Next question, please. Okay, so please look at this picture carefully. This is called sunrise syndrome. It is caused by displacement of haptic in by lens pulse, peripheral contraction of lens capsule, contraction of lens capsule, or one haptic in bag and one haptic in sulcus. Please start the timer. Again, a beautiful picture, though the surgeon or the patient are happy to have this uh, condition in their eye. Okay, so well done, 52% of you got the right answer. The right answer is one haptic in bag and one haptic in sulcus. So if one, uh, the superior haptic is uh, in, uh, in the sulcus, then it can lead to uh, superior dislocation of the IOL. Let's go to the next question. So uh, this, this is a picture of macular corneal dystrophy. Now the question is, what is the stain used to stain glycosaminoglycan in macular corneal dystrophy? Is it gypsa, calcoflow white, lysamine green, or alcyon blue? in histopath sections. Well done, 64% of you got the right answer. The right answer is Alcyon blue. So in macular dystrophy, there is deposition of glycosaminoglycan. It can be stained with ancient blue or colloidal iron. Next question, please. Okay, so this is one of the toughest question, I would say. So please, uh, please uh, I, I can give you one clue. He is not a scientist for Pune Institute of Virology. In fact, he is an eminent ophthalmologist of India. So the question is, which position does he hold in the All India Ophthalmological Society? Editor General, Vice President, Chairman, Scientific Committee, or Editor Proceeding. Please start the timer. Photo courtesy goes to Dr. Sabrat. Okay, so 48% of you got the right answer. So he is none other than Dr. Arup Chakravarti. Leaderboard. 
Dr. Anupam is leading the scoreboard, followed by Dharmeshwari T. Then Sarath Gomez are doc, uh, at position three, and Varad Patil and uh, Gulshan Bar Barwa at position four and five. Well, so identify this intraocular lens. Is it multifocal intraocular lens, toric, aspheric lens, accommodative lens, or iris claw lens? This is a very beautiful intraocular lens picture. Please start the timer. Well done, 74% of you got the right answer. It's uh, one accommodative lens. So this is crystal lens from Bershenholm. Uh, it has two hinges, which allows the lens to move back and forth and uh, it allows accommodation. Next question, please. Well, look at this picture and identify this condition. Is it absorbed cataract, dislocated IOL bag complex, Someric ring or drop epinucleus. Please start the timer. So there is this ring separate, uh, this thing inside the vitreous cavity. What is this? Okay, so the right answer is option B, dislocated IOL bag complex. 41% of you got the right answer because I said ring separate thing. So many of you answered option D. Next question, please. Okay, so please look at this picture and identify this condition. Is it ocular squamous, uh, surface squamous neoplasia, limbal dorbal, pterygium, or conjunctival papilloma? Please start the timer. Nice. 96% of you got the right answer. This is limbal dormant. Actually, it's a very, uh, it's pretty straight question. Okay, so this is a benign tumor that contains this difficult to pronounce Cori's tomatoes tissue. That means something which is not at its usual place. So you can see this uh, presence of hair shaft over this uh, nodular lesion. Please go to the next question. Okay, so from this topography image, please identify the con corneal condition. Is it keratoconus, keratoglobus, pellucid marginal degeneration, or none of the above? So what I do if I see this red patch, then I refer the patient to the retina, uh, sorry, the cornea colics. But if you have, don't have cornea colics with you, then you have to know the diagnosis. Well done. 68% have you got the right answer? And the right option is pellucid marginal degeneration. So in this uh, condition, you see crab claw or butterfly-like pattern in the topography image. Next question, the last question. Okay, so actually this is a mock photo of uh, two eminent ophthalmologists of India. So from this photo, please identify who are they. Dr. Partha Viswas, Dr. Rajesh Sinha, Dr. Lalit Verma, Dr. Varun Naik, Dr. Lalit Verma, Dr. Ajay Arora, Dr. Harvans Lar, or Dr. Santo Sonava. Please start the timer.
super 60% of you got the right answer it's a picture of dr lalit verma and varun nayak the above part is dr verma's picture uh, so you you must be uh, seeing him uh, putting his glasses over his forehead and the lower part uh, belongs to dr varun nayak's photo well done so can we have the final score So first position goes to Dr. Anupam Sahu. Second position goes to uh, Dr. Dharmeshwari T. Third position, Dr. Gulson Barbar. Fourth position, Dr. Sarad Gomez. Fifth position, Dr. Bharat Patil. Congratulations to all the winners. Yes, uh, Dr. Dharmeshwari, you please uh, share your details in the chat box. And please write your phone number as well. Let me assure other participants that uh, we did not have a pediatric ophthalmologist meeting for this thing. I think uh, that's the end of today's webinar. And it has been a, a different experience for us because we have always had it so physical that physical interaction is missing. But despite that, I think we have had a very good interaction today. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, all our faculties have given some very excellent talks. The panelists have supported us well. So as we draw to an end, I request Dr. Swapnil Parshan to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. <coughs> On behalf of MGMI Institute, my sincere thanks to all the three invited speakers. Dr. Haraman Slal, Dr. Arup Chakravarti, and Dr. Hari Priya. Uh, I lack words for their willingness and participation in this Fiko Shala 2021 uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for being part of this webinar and giving their valuable inputs during the session. A special mention to our director, Dr. Deepshika Agarwal, who is always behind us and always encourages us to give our best in whatever we do. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Samrat Chatterjee for conducting this webinar very nicely and smoothly. Uh, I would again like to thank Dr. Mona Lisa for this interesting uh, uh, quiz that she conducted. Uh, I would like to thank all my colleague consultants for their untiring efforts in making this webinar a huge success. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank Dr. Mihir and ISD team and uh, Grover Audio Vid Visual a team that includes Mr. Ravi, Mr. Rohit, and Mr. Rupesh. Uh, without their support, we would not have been able to conduct this CME so smoothly. And finally, I would like to thank all the audience for this webinar for being with us throughout and posting interesting questions and interacting. Thank you all again. So we come to end of this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Swapnil. So now I invite you all to lunch at your respective dining rooms. All we are, we are, all we are coming to Dr. Samrat's house. Absolutely, Thank you. absolutely. Thank you everyone. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank you. We can end the uh, session. Thank you.